Skip the Flip, Secrets to 1% Know About Real Estate Investing, written by Hayden Crabtree and read by Hayden Crabtree. 90% of all millionaires become so through owning real estate. More money has been made in real estate than all industrial investments combined. The wise young man or wage earner of today invests his money in real estate. It's by Andrew Carnegie, the richest man in history. Contrary to what most people believe, I think you should share your business secrets. I like to practice an abundance mindset, which to me means there's plenty of success on this earth to be had by both you and me. If I let you in on how to make money in real estate, that is not going to keep me from making money in real estate. So I should be generous and teach you everything I know. This book contains the information you need to skip house flipping and move directly to investing for long-term wealth and monthly cash flow. Flipping houses will make you money. Investing in cash flow real estate will make you wealthy. This book is written to be informative, but more importantly, useful. You're going to learn everything useful I know about finance and real estate from my college degree and also what I've learned in my real world experience. I hope you take this advice and apply it in your own life as I'm writing this book as a tool that I would have given myself to read at the beginning of my own journey. If you're listening to this on audiobook, I want to invite you to also get a free copy of the physical book. Later in this book, we're going to walk through some numbers, some examples. There's charts in the physical book. You can also get the charts for free at HaydenCrabtree.com forward slash resources. So as we go through the book, if you want to see the physical to match along with what we go over in this audio book, go to HaydenCrabtree.com forward slash resources. You can get those free physical charts there. If you want to get the physical book itself, go to HaydenCrabtree.com forward slash free book, and I'll give you a free copy of the physical book as well. Introduction. So how did this book come about? I was at a conference and I left inspired and confused at the same time. I scratched my head in disbelief as I walked out of the hotel. How could they not all be aware of what a huge opportunity exists? I asked my friend and fellow real estate investor, Hunter. To me, it seemed like it was such common knowledge. Such a simple path that anyone can capitalize on to build extreme wealth, reduce their taxes, and generate monthly cash flow. The event I'm speaking about is when I reconnected with 35 high-level entrepreneurs and business-minded people at a reunion. It was an incredible weekend because so many smart people were in the room. We had people with their own businesses and others that were tearing through the ranks at some of the biggest companies in America. As I talked to each individual about what they were up to these days, I got such a cool and awesome stories about how they were changing the world with big data or revolutionizing different industries. As they reciprocated the question, what are you doing these days? I would have to catch myself and say, real estate investing, which is typically my short answer. If I'm not careful, I can talk about real estate for hours without taking a breath. Like you, lots of people have an interest in real estate investing. After talking with many people, I have learned that real estate investing has many different meanings to each individual. Also like you, many smart people at very high levels are not aware of some of the largest behind-the-scenes benefits of real estate. These benefits are so huge that they can change your financial life drastically. You should take a different approach than most when considering getting into their first real estate investment. The way many people get into real estate investing is the slow track, and there's a much faster way for you to get started in real estate. You should skip the flip. As I dive into exactly what it is I do, I can start to see the eyes of the other person light up, almost in disbelief. That makes so much sense. Can I take you out to lunch sometime and pick your brain? I almost always get that question. The reason for this book is because the majority of Americans live paycheck to paycheck, don't have a reliable secondary income stream, and know very little about how true wealth is built in the modern world we live in. The truth of what used to be get a job with a good company, invest in a 401k, and get a pension is long gone. Younger generations will not have pensions or social security to rely on. We're going to have to fend for ourselves on this economic planet. I tell them, it doesn't matter if you have $5 million, $5,000, or just $5. There's a way for you to get started building wealth in the most durable and recession-resistant asset in the world, cash flow real estate. In this book, you're going to learn how cash flow real estate is less risky and more profitable than any other investment. You are also going to learn a simple and proven system you can use to grow your wealth and monthly cash flow exponentially, no matter how much cash you have right now. I graduated college at the top of my class with a real estate and finance degree. But before I graduated at 22 years old, I had flipped several houses, owned six residential rental properties, was a partner in two commercial properties, and had helped others buy more than $7 million of investment properties. After reading this book, you'll be able to use tools to shield your income, decrease your tax bill, value any piece of investment real estate in under 60 seconds, and know the difference between good debt and bad debt.
This will help you assemble an action plan to grow your wealth in real estate investing the right way. Robert Kiyosaki of Rich Dad Poor Dad teaches us that the rich do not work for money. The rich use money to buy assets that make them more money. The average millionaire has seven streams of income, and you're going to learn in this book how to get started building reliable and massive streams of income from real estate each and every month. After reading this book, I promise you, you will fully understand how to profit from real estate and build multiple streams of income. And I promise you'll learn everything I learned from my college real estate degree and more in under 150 pages. This book is designed to be a short and sweet guide. It will not waste any of your precious time on information you don't need to know. Every page is going to be useful and applicable. Don't be the person who misses out on life-changing deals that they see every day without even realizing it because they refuse to invest in their financial education. Be the kind of person who takes responsibility for his or her financial life. Be the kind of person who creates wealth for themselves and their family that will last forever. The information in the following pages is solely responsible for creating 90% of the world's millionaires. If you know what you're doing in real estate, you can earn millions in residual income each year. But if you do not educate yourself on the fundamentals and the right systems, you can lose it all like so many did in 2008. This book is the operating system for your brain that will allow you to see opportunities that will create life-changing wealth for yourself and those around you. Are you ready? All right, let's do it. Section one, debunk myths. Before we get started with the fundamentals of successful real estate investing, let's do a mindset check. The most important thing you can do to fast track to success is adopt a new mindset. If you're stuck with an old mindset, the information you read will not resonate and will not impact your actions. This is not what we want, as information is only good if you put it to work. The information in the following chapters has cost me more than 50000 in college education and another 20 plus thousand in seminar and coaching fees. It has also taken years of my life to discover much of this information through trial and error. You're going to be able to take full advantage of that by listening to this audio program. To start working on your new mindset, let's debunk some myths you have heard that aren't true and are going to hold you back from real estate success. Chapter 1, Real Estate License. You do not need a real estate degree or license to make money in real estate. Many people think that to get involved in real estate investing, they need to go through the process of getting tested and getting licensed to become an agent or broker. And I'm here to tell you, in fact, the opposite is true. Getting your real estate license can actually hinder you from making better investments. When you have your real estate license, you're held to a certain standard that will present friction in your investing process. The most successful investors I know do not have a license, and you don't need one either to get started. We are going to talk in this book about what an investor does and how they make money. You do not need a license or a degree to be a great investor, so don't let this idea slow you down. Chapter 2. Debt is bad. You have heard about people who want to change their financial life as a kickstart they cut up their credit cards. This is not your path to wealth. You must get comfortable with debt to shortcut your success in real estate investing. We will do a deep dive in Section 8, but for now, you need to understand that debt is neither good nor bad. Instead, debt is a tool. It is what you make it. Debt is good and debt is bad. The way you should think of it is debt as a chainsaw. Right? When used correctly, a chainsaw can help you cut down trees in a tenth of the time it would take without a chainsaw. With an axe, it may take you an hour to cut down a tree. With a chainsaw, you could cut down that same tree in less than 10 minutes. While that chainsaw is very useful, if it's not treated with care and respect, it can cause a lot of harm. Do not listen to anyone who says all debt is bad, as that person is unaware of the potential benefits that debt can have. If you look at the USA, we have a massive debt. Okay, While some think that is bad, the same debt has helped expand our economy into a global powerhouse and has given our people one of the highest standards of living in the world. At the time of writing this book, Apple has $245 billion in cash. Yes, that's a B, billion, but they still choose to use debt. Why is that? They know that when debt is used correctly, it can have a positive outcome on their profits. Chapter 3, You Don't Need Money I don't have any money to invest in real estate. This is one of the biggest mental blocks that prevents so many people from getting started investing. There are several strategies you can use to overcome this roadblock, and you're going to learn a few ways in this book. When I first got started in real estate, this was my strongest limited belief. I thought I would never become a real estate success until I had piles of my own money I could use. It wasn't until I hired a coach and learned the skills to see that having money is not a real reason to not invest in real estate and start building wealth. One great example of how to overcome this is found in the bonus section of this book and shows how I bought a $3 million property that profits $108,000 a year with no money of my own. Yes, you read that right. 
108000 a year with no money, and you can do the same. The first key to getting over this mental block is learning all about how investing works and building confidence in yourself as an investor. That comes with education and is a process everyone must go through. You are on the right road to educating yourself by reading this book. Chapter 4, Real Estate Risk. If you listen to many people who got crushed in 2008, they will tell you to stay out of real estate. What many do not know about the crash of 2008 is that some investors became extremely wealthy during that time. Just as a side note here, this isn't in the book. I'm recording this audio during the coronavirus, and I think we're about to see another 2008-like situation in real estate because of the credit market seizing up. That's a whole other discussion, but you should listen to this chapter on real estate risk and pay really close attention because uh, it's going to apply here in the future. Okay, so what, what I was saying is that some people – they don't know the 2008 crash made a lot of people really wealthy. Okay, In the 2008 crash, people built massive wealth because they capitalized on the mistakes of others. And you too can capitalize on the mistakes of others if you understand the fundamental laws of investing. The investors who lost during 2008 were not following the fundamental laws of real estate investing outlined in this audio program. The investors who use good fundamentals like the ones taught here are the ones who created life-changing wealth. The main fundamental law to follow to avoid pain in a recession is to buy real estate for cash flow rather than to flip it for a one-time profit. While all investing carries some risk, if you follow the fundamental laws, you can drastically reduce the risk and set yourself up to make it through and profit from any downturn or recession. Chapter 5, House Flipping or Wholesaling is Investing. Flipping houses can produce a tremendous income for people who do it successfully, but flipping houses is not investing, and it's not how wealth is created in real estate. By flipping houses rather than investing, you spin your wheels always looking to buy and sell. You will have a hard time creating the stability and cash flow that is produced from commercial real estate investing when you're flipping houses. Flipping houses is an active job or is a business you can create. Do not confuse yourself by thinking flipping houses is investing. Flipping is not bad if you're looking for a side job or a side hustle to create some extra income. The goal of flipping houses should be to create extra money to put into cash flow real estate that is going to pay you each month for the rest of your life. For those of you who have heard or currently are wholesaling, know that wholesaling is not investing in real estate like flipping houses is not investing. Wholesaling is a business that involves connecting a buyer and a seller for a fee. For those who don't know what wholesaling is, we will get into that briefly in Chapter 15. Also, flipping and wholesaling do not provide many of the tremendous behind-the-scenes benefits that real estate investing does. You will learn all about these benefits through these pages. I actually prefer wholesaling to flipping houses because wholesaling is like flipping, but it can take out a lot of your risk. Chapter 6, Your Home is Not an Investment. To understand why this is a myth, let's quickly define what an asset is and what a liability is. An asset is something that puts money into your pocket. In the book, I have a great image that shows you a house and has an arrow pointing to you with a dollar sign, meaning the house pays you. This is what an asset is. A liability is something that takes money out of your pocket. In the book, I have a picture of you and an arrow pointing to a house with money, meaning you are putting money into the house. And this is what a liability is. Your goal in real estate investing is to acquire assets that pay you every month without having to do any work, meaning you would still get paid if you're on vacation or if you're doing other work that you love. When you acquire assets that pay you more than the money you spend, you have financial freedom. You can rely on your assets to pay for your expenses rather than relying on a job. Financial freedom is the ultimate goal. Back to why your house you live in is not a good investment. Homes that are purchased for personal use cost money. You have to pay for repairs, insurance, taxes, and mortgage payments. All this is money that is coming out of your pocket. This is the definition of a liability. On the flip side, if that home is rented out and starts to produce income that went into your pocket, it would become an asset if it were cash flow positive. The idea that a home is a great investment is sold to us by the big banks who need customers for loans. These banks make money when someone borrows money from them. To increase their profits, they need to make more loans. So they sell the idea of the American dream as owning your own home with a white picket fence around the front yard. When you finally achieve the American dream of home ownership, you go borrow money from them to buy the home and they make more money. Listen, I'm not against home ownership, but you need to understand that if you're going to live in a house, it's a liability and not an asset. Whenever you buy a house, it's not contributing towards your financial freedom. It's actually taking away from that because it's going to cost you money every month. Many of you listening to this right now will say, but a home's value will increase and I'll make a return on it that way. That's true, but the fundamental law of real estate investing for wealth is invest for cash flow. A house you live in does not pay you, so it's not an asset. If we bet on appreciation, we're gambling, not investing. 
Now that I have addressed some of the flawed mindsets, you can set those aside and focus on the upcoming lessons that we're about to go through. Use this chapter as a reference when you hear these myths come up on your real estate investing journey. If you have any questions about any of these myths, visit my website at haydencrabtree.com forward slash resources and submit your question. I'll get back to you and help you clarify any questions you have about any of these myths. If you think that you know having a license or a degree is necessary and you have more questions about how to get started without a license or a degree, I'll be happy to help you guys out. Just go to haydencrabtree.com forward slash resources and submit your question there. Section two, real estate versus stocks. The next step in your journey is to comprehend the difference in real estate versus other forms of investing. When most people think about investing, they think about the stock market. I think the stock market is a roller coaster that I do not want to ride. Real estate is fundamentally different than the stock market. Before I got started on my real estate journey, I looked at stock investing. I would study books about the fundamentals of stocks, research companies, and look at the technical analysis. It got very old very quickly. I dreaded staring at charts all day, hoping that the prices would go up or down in my favor. I did not have any control on the market price of the stocks I wanted to buy or sell. I want to be able to control my investment. This is where real estate is different than the stock market. You do not control stocks. You do control real estate. Many people counter this argument, citing that Warren Buffett, the greatest investor of all time, has made his fortune in stocks. While he has had great success investing in stocks, I always point out that Warren Buffett is not only buying stocks. Warren Buffett is buying businesses. Warren buys large chunks of companies so that he can control them strategically and add value to them over long periods of time. I don't know about you, but I don't want to wait 10 plus years to see the fruits of my labor, and I want more control in my monthly cash flow. Let's talk through a few points to illustrate how the life of a real estate investor is different than that of a stock investor. Chapter 7, Control. Real estate gives its owner the ability to control the value of his or her asset. You cannot control the value of your stocks no matter how hard you try. You can spend endless hours researching stocks, but you still cannot control the value of the investment. With stock investing, the fate of your money is in the hands of someone else and you're subject to being manipulated. In real estate investing, you control the value of your asset. You do not wake up one morning to see that a tweet from the president has made the value of your money increase or decrease by 10%. One of the biggest lessons to take away from this book is that real estate is superior to all other forms of investing due to the level of control the owner has. Put yourself in a position to control your own destiny. Don't rely on other people to do this for you. Chapter 8, Tangible. Real estate is, well, real. You can touch it, you can use it, you can visit it, improve it, make alterations. The great thing about real estate investing is you own a piece of the world. It's a one of a kind, nothing else like it in the world. If you own a share of Apple stock, you own one of 800 million identical shares. That piece that you have cannot be touched, it cannot be altered by you, and you can't walk into Apple and say, hey, let's change this up over here. I think we could make more money if we did it this way. You're on their fictitious roller coaster. If you own a short-term rental property on the beach, you can vacation there. If you own an apartment complex, you can live there. If you own a storage facility, you can store your things there. How can you use a stock if you own it? It's not real. It's not tangible. Chapter 9, Predictable. In the stock market, the general value tends to rise as time moves forward, but you cannot predict where your stocks will be worth tomorrow, next month, or next year. Many have a large majority of their wealth they've worked for their whole life tied up in a few stocks. What happens when the company releases lower than expected earnings and the stock value drops instantly? Poof. Gone. That wasn't part of your financial plan, was it? The point here is that you should invest with as much certainty and predictability as possible. Real estate is predictable. Before you buy it, you can very accurately estimate how much money you're going to make from it and when. You know that rent is due on the first and how much that rent is going to be. You know how much your property is worth and how much you can get for it if you sell that property. Don't let someone else control you. You control you. Chapter 10, Debt is Your Friend. The definition of leverage is to use something to its maximum advantage. That could be a crowbar to open a door. We're using a piece of metal to do something we cannot do on our own. It could be hiring an attorney to handle legal matters for you. We are hiring an attorney who has knowledge we do not have to do something for us. We are leveraging that attorney for our benefit. In the case of real estate, we use banks to help us buy more real estate than we can afford with our own cash. You're likely already familiar with this concept through mortgage lending. When buying a house for $100,000, you can go to the bank and they will give you $80,000 and you have to put in $20,000 of your own money. This concept, leverage, allows us to buy more assets than we could buy on our own. 
We use other people's money to increase our personal wealth. If you had $100,000, you could buy the house for 100000 on your own. Because we're able to use leverage and buy that same house for 20000 of our own money and 80000 of the bank's money, we can now buy five homes instead of one. There is massive power in leverage in real estate. Section 8 details leverage and the benefits it will bring to your life. Chapter 11, Political Risk. Love them or hate them, it doesn't matter. Politicians impact our entire economy. When the president tweets about foreign policy, interest rates, or anything else for that matter, he impacts the lives of everyone invested in the stock market. Meanwhile, real estate investors know that their property is going to keep producing cash, shielding their taxes, and building wealth. We real estate investors don't care and barely notice what is happening on Wall Street and in the news. We keep collecting our rent checks on the first of the month, having our tenants pay for our expenses, our debt, and putting cash in our pockets each and every month. Chapter 12, Shield Your Income. We're going to go through a whole section of tax benefits later, but for now you need to understand and be aware that there are loopholes and incentives in the U.S. tax code that allow real estate investors to write off ghost expenses. These benefits do not come to house flippers, agents, brokers, or wholesalers. They only come to true investors like I'm going to teach you here. We get to take large expenses that we didn't actually have to pay for and put them on our tax returns. These will shield our income from taxes and allows us to make money without it being taxed in any way. It is very powerful and very real. With the large tax benefits, it is possible for an investor to buy an entire property with the same money they were going to pay in taxes. Don't ignore Section 7 on tax benefits when we get there. Taxes are people's number one largest expense. If you could eliminate your largest expense every year, how would your financial life change? Chapter 13, Get Creative. Real estate investing allows you to be creative. Trying to strike a deal to buy a property? Get creative. There are endless options out there you can use to meet your needs as an investor and the needs of the owner of a property you would like to buy. You can also be creative with how you run a property to increase income, decrease expenses, and make your tenants happier. This will increase the value of your property. You cannot do this in stocks because with stocks you're not in control. Real estate equals control, stability, predictability, and tax benefits. Stocks equal no control, manipulation, and taxes on profits. To recap, in real estate you have control, you can use your property to benefit yourself, can predict your future income, use debt as your friend, use a bank's money to make yourself wealthy, enjoy tax benefits, and use creativity to get a deal done. Hopefully you're beginning to see why real estate is more stable and a productive place to put your financial future than the stock market. Real estate investing is like playing offense in football. You're going to be calling the plays, putting blockers in place so you can score, and deciding which players to give the ball to. Investing in stocks is like playing defense. You have to try and predict what the other team is going to do, and if you're wrong, well, you lose. It's being proactive versus being reactive. When it comes to your money, be proactive and be in control. Section 3, Different Ways to Make Money in Real Estate. To give you a brief background on the specific angle you're going to learn for real estate investing, you need to have a quick overview of all the different ways one can make a profit in real estate. This way, when you're talking to others, you have a base level education and will sound like a professional. Listen on to get a quick description of each path with the pros and cons of each angle. Chapter 14. What is wholesaling? Wholesaling property is a great way to make money from real estate without actually buying it. A wholesaler can sometimes be referred to as a bird dog. What a wholesaler does is go into the marketplace and look for deals they can sell to an investor who wants to buy the property for long-term investment. They may also be looking for a house that a house flipper would like to buy and flip. The steps to performing a wholesale are as follows. The wholesaler drives around neighborhoods or goes online to find properties that meet what they are looking for. They get a list of all the properties that could be a fit. They then begin to contact the owners of those properties and ask them if they would like to sell their property. Most of the properties they are looking for are in bad shape and need work. This is a sign of motivation that the owner may want to sell. This is a good thing for property buyers. While many of the owners tell them no, some say they would like to sell. At this point, the wholesaler would like to gain control of the property. They can do this by putting the property under contract. This is a formal agreement between the buyer and the seller that they have a deal, but the buyer needs some time before they can actually give the seller the money for the property. This is a standard procedure when you put a contract on a property. It's going to take a little while for you to actually buy it. Once the property is under contract, if the contract is written correctly, the seller cannot make an agreement to sell the property to any other buyer and they have a legal obligation to sell the property to you at the terms set in the contract. On the flip side of the coin, the buyer, who is the wholesaler in this situation, has power now because they have control of the property. If the contract is written correctly, they have the power to go and find someone who filled their shoes as the buyer. In exchange for letting someone else buy this great deal, they'll get paid a fee. 
There are no normal wholesale fees. How much a wholesaler gets paid is dependent on what price they can get the seller to agree to sell to them at and how much the property is actually worth. An example, Dave is a wholesaler. Dave goes and finds a house on ABC Street that looks run down and needs some love. Dave does some research and finds out that Bill owns the house. Dave contacts Bill and tells him he would like to buy the house. Dave does his research and figures out that the house is worth $100,000 as is, and if fixed up, it could be worth $150,000. Dave tells Bill that he will offer him $50,000. Bill gets angry at first, but then tells Dave he'll do the deal at $65,000. Dave writes a contract with Bill, and they agree to do the transaction for $65,000 in 60 days from signing the contract. Now Dave, who has a contract for the property, goes to an investor he knows, let's call him Tom, and tells Tom about this great deal he has. He tells Tom that the house is worth $100,000 now, and if Tom were to fix it up for $20,000 in repairs, it would be worth $150,000. He also tells Tom that he'll sell him the house today for $90,000 so that Tom will have $10,000 of equity at purchase. The equity is the instant money that Tom makes. It's the difference between the $90,000 he buys it for and the $100,000 it's worth. This sounds like a great deal to Tom, and it's what he's looking for, so he agrees. Tom pays Dave $90,000, and then Dave gives Bill $65,000. Everyone is happy. Dave never has to buy the house or put up any money. He simply assigns this contract to Tom for $90,000. Dave now gets a profit of $90,000 minus $65,000, which comes out to $25,000. That's Dave's profit. This is one example. The profits on these deals can be smaller or sometimes much bigger. The pros of wholesaling are no or little money is needed, you can make quick cash, and you can do this anywhere in the U.S. with just internet and a cell phone. The cons is this is one-time money. There's a risk that Tom, who's going to buy the property from you, falls through and you make no money. This is treated as regular income for tax purposes. You get no tax benefits, and you're still working a job. This is not investing. If you quit working and you're not taking action to make this happen, you stop making money. Let's keep it rolling. Let's keep it rolling. We're about to talk here. Chapter 15. Chapter 15. Chapter 15. Chapter 15. Flipping properties. You're most likely already familiar with flipping, but let's spend a quick second on flipping to understand why it's not investing. The process of flipping is buying a property that is outdated and needs work. Once the work is done, you hope that the value of the property has increased by more than you spent on the improvements. Let's define a couple keywords. ARV. ARV stands for after repair value. This is what the flipper can sell the house for after it is fixed up. Closing costs. Closing costs are what we, as a property owner, will pay when we are selling the property. Standard commissions to an agent in residential property is 5 to 6% of the purchase price paid by the person selling the property. Standard commissions to an agent in residential is 5 to 6% of the purchase price paid by the person selling the property. Also, we'll have to pay legal fees, which we can estimate at 1% for the sake of this example. Who pays what closing costs and legal fees depend on what state and county you're in. Each county will have a standard split of what the buyer pays and what the seller pays, but this is all negotiable in your transaction. Some examples of closing costs include some examples of closing costs include title search and transaction fees to pay the attorney or title company for their time spent helping you buy or sell the property. These fees mean that if we sell a house for $100,000, then we're only going to walk away with $93,000 because we had $7,000 or 7% 7 of fees we had to pay. Rehab budget is how much the flipper anticipates spending on the materials and labors such as countertops, new roofs, new floors, paint, labor, and permit fees from the city if applicable. Depending on what kind of condition the house is in and how nice you want to make the house, this is going to determine how much rehab budget you'll need to put into the property. Holding costs are the expenses we're going to have to pay for owning a property. These costs include power bills, water bills, property insurance, property taxes, and other costs that come with property ownership. The longer you own a property while you're flipping it, the more in holding costs you're going to have. The final piece we need to understand is profit. This is how much the flipper would like to make from the transaction after all expenses are paid. The flipper should buy the property according to the following formula. ARV minus closing costs minus rehab budget minus holding costs minus profit equals purchase price. So again, the after repair value, which is the value when we're done fixing it up, 
minus our closing costs, minus our rehab budget, minus our holding costs, minus our profit is going to be how much we want to pay for the property when we're buying it as a flipper. If a flipper follows the above formula, they will know how much to pay for a property when a wholesaler or agent comes to them with a potential property they can buy. Pro tip, leave yourself at least 30% profit margin as a flipper. Do not cut your profit short. If the deal doesn't work, it doesn't work. Don't bend your rules. Move on to the next deal and pass up deals with thin margins. If you run into unexpected expenses you didn't plan, which you're guaranteed to run into unexpected expenses, you're going to be working on a house flip with no profit built in and you're going to be working for free. Flipping a house is not investing in real estate because you're actively working on a project until it's finished. Then to make a profit, you actually have to sell the product. You'll only make money from a house flip when you successfully sell the property to someone else. This is no different than what any product-based business does. They build a product and then in order to make money off of it, they have to sell it. If you do not sell the product, you make no money. With house flipping, the longer you hold the house without selling it, the less money you'll make in profit because your holding costs are going to rise over time. This is a normal business and it's not a bad way of doing things, but you have to realize this is a different model and strategy than real estate investing is. Please do not confuse flipping for profits with investing that will build long-term wealth and monthly cash flow. Here's a first-time flipper mistake. Most first-time house flippers think that they're going to do a lot of the work themselves and they're going to make an extra profit because they're not going to pay a professional to fix the toilets or install new flooring. Often people will have to do the work themselves to make the numbers work and come out with a profit. What most people overlook in this equation is the value of their own time. If you're an accountant that can make $50 an hour, you'd be doing yourself a disservice by working on a house flip. You may think you're going to save money by doing the work yourself instead of hiring a company or person to do it for you. Painting is not hard. Anyone can do it, including you. So why would you pay someone when you can do it yourself? But here's the thing. If your best skill is being an accountant, then you should do accounting at $50 an hour because you can hire somebody to paint for you at $15 an hour. By painting yourself, you're really losing 15 minus 50 equals $35 every hour you spend painting instead of accounting. One of the X factors that leads to a high dropout rate in house flipping is that when you have a day job and you're trying to flip houses is the amount of frustration that you're going to run into. You work all day from 9 to 5 and then you go to work on your house flip from 5 to 11 p.m. at night. Your quality of work is not as good as a professional, but you think doing it yourself will be cheaper. You also really want to get the flip completed to get your payday, so you spend all day Saturday and Sunday working to complete the flip. This goes on for several months and you quickly become exhausted and fed up with flipping. You haven't seen your friends, you haven't had a social life, haven't watched a ball game, haven't had quality time with your significant other. Eventually you get the house done, put it on the market after months of laboring for it to sit on the market and wait. Your holding costs rise to where they begin to eat into your profit. You grow nervous so you drop the price in hopes it will help itself faster. The flipping formula for people who do work themselves looks like this. After repair value, minus closing costs, minus rehab budget, minus holding costs, minus their time, minus purchase price equals profit. When you do any of the physical work yourself, you need to factor in your time into the equation so you can find out if you're actually making money or if you would actually have a loss instead of a profit when being paid for your time on other activities. This is the unfortunate story of most first-time house flippers, and I don't want this for you. You need to invest your money one time and get paid a profit each and every month for the rest of your life without having to labor. This is called acquiring assets. When you shift from house flipping for a profit to real estate investing for a monthly cash flow, you put yourself in a position to build incredible wealth, have free time, and live a quality life doing the things you love. There's so much more to house flipping that we could talk about, but for the purpose of this section, I need you to realize that house flipping can be profitable, but it's less stable and will not make you wealthy like commercial investing for cash flow will. Let's spend our time together educating you on acquiring assets that puts cash flow in your pocket consistently every month and forever. Here's the pros to house flipping. Can be profitable if done right. Here's the cons. Requires cash. It's one-time money, meaning you only get paid when the property sells. It's taxed as regular income if the house flip takes you under a year, which you hope a house flip doesn't take you more than a year. So if you meet your goal, you're going to be paying regular income taxes on those profits. There's no tax benefits. It's not really investing. It's dependent on the end buyer to actually perform and to buy the property from you for you to get paid. It can take long periods of time, can be very frustrating, and it depends on real estate values for you to actually make money. 
One of the biggest cons is that real estate markets can change while you're in the middle of a flip. So if you buy a flip at the height of 2007 and the flip isn't going to be ready until 2008, well, your house flip could go completely wrong because now the real estate market has shifted in the middle of your flip. This is a huge risk. Chapter 16, being an agent. When you listen to the previous section on flipping, you might have been surprised to find such a big part of your property sales proceeds goes to real estate commissions. This is why so many people get their real estate license and try and become a realtor. A realtor has the potential to make a lot of money by selling other people's properties for them or by helping a home buyer or investor find the property they'd like to buy. There are two different kinds of realtors. The first is the listing agent who represents the current property owner who's trying to sell their property. The next kind of agent represents the property buyers who are looking for properties to buy. The realtors or brokers on the transaction are responsible for representing their clients through the entire process and telling them what they should be cautious of and how the entire buying or selling process works. The truth is many people don't understand very simple things about real estate such as what the title is, what due diligence is, why it's important, and what it means for earnest money to go hard. This is where an agent should guide you and this is why they get paid. My goal for you as an investor is to know all of this yourself. In exchange for their efforts, the realtors are typically each paid 25 to 3% of the sales price as a commission. Both sides of the commission are normally paid by the property seller in a typical real estate transaction. If it's a larger transaction, the property seller may negotiate with the listing agent to pay a 4%, which would be 2% to each agent, instead of 6%. Or instead, the seller may tell the agent that they only want to pay the listing agent commission, and if the buyer's agent wants to get paid, the buyer's going to have to pay them themselves. There are no set in stone rules on commissions, but there are norms in the industry. To calculate how much an agent can make off of a transaction, simply multiply their commission percentage by the sales price. A 3% commission on a $100,000 house would be a $3,000 payday. A 3% commission on a million dollar house would be a $30,000 payday. Many people who go and get their license look at these numbers and tell themselves, if I could just sell a few million dollar houses a year, I'm going to be doing better than I am at my current job. But what many people who dive in headfirst don't realize is that the realtor business is really a relationship business, not a real estate business. To get listings or to represent a buyer on a transaction, you must have a relationship with the property seller or buyer. It can take years and years to build the kind of strong, quality relationships you need in order to have a big, vibrant book of business that's going to make you a lot of money as a realtor. You can certainly do it, but most people think once they get their license, the business will pour in and that just doesn't happen. Another thing to consider is how long it can take to make money. Once you list a property or start to look for a property for a buyer, you could spend weeks or months finding the right property or person to buy your property. Once you do find that person, you have to negotiate the terms. Then you have to get a contract signed. Once the contract is signed, it could take another two to three months for the property to close and then you'll finally get paid. This is a long time and a lot of work in order to actually get your first paycheck. Being an agent is a full-time job that I would classify as a service-based business rather than a real estate business. The best agents serve their clients to the highest degree and that's why they're successful. The pros of being an agent, little money is needed to get in and you can make a lot of money off of other people's properties. The cons to being an agent is it can take a long time to make money it's not as easy as everyone thinks. It's not investing. There are no tax benefits. You have to get a license and register under a broker to get started. And you have to share your commission with a broker. Here's a pro tip. If you're selling a property, I would recommend paying the normal commissions to your agent as you want to have your interest as a seller aligned with both agents. If you try to skimp your realtors on their commissions, are they really going to fight hard to get you the maximum price from a seller? If you tell the other side that you're not going to pay them, will they bring their buyer to your property or they tell their buyer that there's a better deal down the road that happens to have a commission on it for them? Chapter 17, Residential Investing. Investing in homes is how many people get started building true wealth in real estate. It was my first cash flow investment. A house makes sense to most people and it doesn't present too much of a mental roadblock because we can all wrap our heads around a house. A popular and easy route that most people take when they get started is to buy a home to live in. Once they move out, instead of selling the house, they'll rent it out. Because they're going to live in it for some time, this is called an owner-occupant. The owner-occupant qualifies for some great financing programs that don't require a lot of cash to get started. The government wants you to own a house. If you own a house, you'll have a house payment, property taxes, and the general ownership of that house will boost the economy. You also want to have a job so that you can make these payments each month. When a toilet breaks, you call a plumber. When the roof has a leak, you call a roofer. Remember what you learned earlier? A house is going to take money out of your pocket. Home ownership leads to more dollars exchanging hands in the economy, and that's what the government wants. 
So they incentivize banks to give out special mortgages that make it very easy for most people to become a homeowner. There are some programs out there where you can get into a house for zero dollars out of your own pocket. That means if you buy a house for $100,000, the bank will give you all $100,000. The majority of programs do require you to have some skin in the game and put down three to five percent of the purchase price. So three to five thousand dollars down on a hundred thousand dollar house. With programs like these out there, there are many people who have built their real estate investments up by buying a house with little to no money of their own. Once they meet the qualifications of living there for a year, they move out and rent the house to a tenant, and then they go buy another one and repeat the process. This is the big shift from house flipping to real investing. The way we make money off of rental property is by collecting rents from the tenants, paying the expenses, paying to bank our monthly payment, and then at the end of each month, we have money left over to keep for ourselves. Here's what a house investment would look like every month. Rental income is $1,800. Insurance is $200. Property taxes is $300. And our mortgage payment is $1,100. Now we figure out how much we're going to make, which is our rental income minus our insurance minus our property taxes minus our mortgage equals our profit. That'd come out to $1,800 minus $200 minus $300 minus $1,100 equals $200. In business, we call income minus expenses profit. In real estate, we call it rental income minus expenses equals cash flow. The investor is making $200 a month from this house and he's having his mortgage paid for at the same time. We call this cash flow positive when the income from the rent is greater than all the expenses you've paid and you have a profit at the end of the month. We'll go deeper into how a mortgage works in a later chapter, but understand that by paying the mortgage every month, the investor is making money there too. Each month, the amount owed to the bank goes down. Now consider if the investor did this once a year for the next five years. The investor would now own five homes and would make an $1,000 extra a month without a large time obligation every month. Each month, five mortgages would be paid down by your tenants for you. If $1,000 a month doesn't sound great to you, don't worry. This is just the beginning. It gets much better. The key here is to make sure that the amount you can rent a house for is greater than the expenses. You do not want rental income to be less than your expenses. At that point, you're paying for someone else to live in your house and your cash flow positive asset becomes a cash flow negative liability. Remember, asset is something that puts money in your pocket. Liability is something that takes money out of your pocket. Make sure you acquire assets and not acquire liabilities. The beautiful thing about real estate investing is that it doesn't require a lot of ongoing time and effort on behalf of the property owner once you know what you're doing. Think about this for yourself when you've rented a place for your personal housing. How often did you contact the landlord? Probably only once a month when you had to pay rent. As a property owner, you're on the flip side of that equation. Most of the time, you only hear from a tenant when they're paying their rent and giving you money. There are many things you can do as a landlord to properly and legally screen potential tenants to make sure they're good people and will not be a pain in your neck. This is a major key to residential investing. Make sure you have great tenants. The tenants you allow to live in your house will either make your life amazing or make it hell. Do your proper research before letting someone move in. The idea of buying one house and renting it for cash flow and then doing this again to build more cash flow is what we in real estate call the snowball effect. Once you have one house, things move slowly because you're waiting to qualify for your next low money down loan. You're also waiting on your bank account to fill back up so you can spend your excess money on your next investment. As time goes on, your monthly cash flow builds up more and more and you begin to have your bank account fill up quicker and quicker. This reduces the time between each of your investment and grows at a faster rate each time. Like a snowball, it gets bigger and goes faster when it goes down a hill. This is how most people get started, and it has made more people wealthy than they could ever imagine just by working a normal job and investing in real estate rentals. Most people also say to themselves right now, yeah, and in addition to making a $200 cash flow profit every month and the mortgage paying down, the house is going to rise in value over time. I agree, and this is where a lot of wealth is built, but one of the main points for you to take away from this book will be explained in the next chapter. You really need to pay attention to the next chapter to fully understand why residential investing is good, but not the best path for true wealth. Also, by betting on the house value to rise, we're not practicing good fundamentals of investing. You shouldn't invest in a house that has $0 cash flow each month just because you think the value of that house will go up. This is gambling. My personal rule is that I will not invest in a property unless it is cash flow positive. We hope and think that the value of the investment will go up over time, but we should only bet on that if we have cash flow. In addition to the house value going up in time, your tenants paying off your mortgage for you, and putting money in your pocket every month, you get amazing tax benefits for renting out a house too. We're going to go into all these different tax benefits in Section 7. 
A simple example of tax benefits for now. If you buy a house for $100,000 and make it a rental property, you'll get to take that $100,000 and depreciate it over the next 27 and a half years. $100,000 divided by 27 and a half comes out to $3,636. This means that every year you could profit $3,636 and not have to pay any taxes on that profit. It's really amazing. Notice how in the example you made $200 a month. That comes out to $2,400 a year. With depreciation, that would mean you would keep all $2,400 without paying any taxes on it, and you have an extra $1,236 of depreciation that you can use to shield other income you make from your regular job. This is a small example to show you one tax break real estate investors get, but this is just the start of the amazing powers real estate provides. We will also talk about how you get to write off interest you pay on your mortgage. Again, more on this in section seven. Investing in residential real estate is true investing, unlike any of the other methods we talked about before this, but it gets even better than this. The pros of residential real estate investing. First, you get monthly cash flow. Second, you get your home value increasing over the long term. Third, you get tenants paying off your mortgage. Fourth, you use a bank's money to buy your own home. Five, low and no money down programs. Six, tax benefits. Seven, residual income with little effort. This is true investing. The cons of residential investing. One is you have tenant risk. If your tenants are bad, that's a risk to your property. Two, in residential investing, you have a slow snowball. And three, you get small amounts of cash flow like we talked about, 200 bucks a month from a house, something of that nature. You're not going to make $10,000, $20,000 a month off of a house. So that's a downside. Chapter 18, commercial investing. Commercial real estate investing follows the same exact blueprint as residential. Make sure the money you receive from rents is more than the money you have to pay for expenses. The difference here is that instead of a house, we may have an office building, a shopping center, gas station, a grocery store, a medical building, an apartment complex, a self-storage facility, a hotel, a golf course, a vacation resort, a car wash, or even a piece of land we rent out. As you can see, there are many different types of commercial real estate, but the ways you can make money off of them are the same. We always want to analyze the property before we buy it to make sure that it's going to be a cash flow positive real estate asset. This is called underwriting, and you will learn all about it in this audio program. Underwriting is an essential skill for an investor. Many residential investors never graduate to commercial investing, which is a shame. There is no secret to investing in commercial real estate, and again, you do not have to have any sort of license or degree to invest in commercial real estate. Every commercial investor I've talked to about their experience says the same thing when I ask them what their biggest mistake has been. They always answer immediately, waiting too long to get started on bigger deals. To repeat, commercial investing is no different than residential investing. The biggest difference is that you're going to make more money in commercial investing than you are in residential. There are a few differences that are worth noting and learning about. In commercial real estate, we'll not be able to get as good as a loan from the bank. If we buy a property for a million dollars, we're only going to be able to get between seven hundred fifty and eight hundred thousand dollars from the bank to buy that property, and we're going to have to come up with the rest in cash. We're not going to be able to get as good a loan on commercial properties as we can on residential because banks are not incentivized by the government to give out awesome loans. Banks know that commercial real estate is not somewhere we're going to live, and generally it's an investment. If an investment goes bad, people are much more likely to walk away from that investment than they are their home for where they live. For this reason, the banks want us to have a larger amount of our own money in the deal, so we're less likely to walk away if things do get rocky in that investment. They always want the amount of cash that the property produces to be more than enough to cover the cost of expenses and the mortgage. This ensures they always get paid their money back. While this seems like an obstacle for those of you who don't have that much cash, please don't turn this off and put this book back on the shelf. You're going to learn ways to overcome this and get started investing in commercial properties to make your cash flow snowball grow bigger, faster. The next chapter is going to take a deep dive in the comparison between residential and commercial, so we will continue this section there. We will talk about how commercial real estate is less risky than residential and how there's less emotion involved. This is good for you. Use the below pros and cons section as a reference for what is to come in the next section. Pros. Much larger profit potential. You get to control what your property is worth based on income. Enough income to delegate all ongoing responsibilities. Multiple tenants means you have income diversification. You have a greater value add opportunity in commercial than you do residential. We'll get into what value add is later. The cons. It's scary for new investors and more cash is needed to purchase it. Chapter 19, development. Let's briefly touch on property development. 
Development consists of taking a piece of land and building on it. You can develop condos, apartment, medical office, etc. Anything you see that is not a raw piece of land has been a development project at one time. Property development is a great way to take an underutilized piece of property and maximize its potential. Most people think that property developers take a raw piece of land and build a building on it and sell it right away when it's built. This is only one type of property development. I will not advocate for or against this strategy, but I will say that it's not true real estate investing if you're developing a property with the intent to sell it once it's built. If you are doing this, you're doing the same thing as flipping a house with a slight variation. House flipping is essentially a form of redevelopment. On the other hand, if you're developing a property with the intention of holding it to rent out and create cash flow for yourself once it's completed, this is investing and can be a great way to create amazing deals. When the real estate market is hot and prices are sky high, making it difficult to find a good cash flow property to buy where the numbers make sense, development can create great deals when you can't find them anywhere else. Most people hear the horror stories of 2008 and how so many property developers went bankrupt and automatically assume any sort of property development is risky. I'm in the middle of a development project right now and I don't view the project as risky. Here's why. The developers that got crushed in 2008 were taking out large loans on their properties that depended on their projects selling to be repaid. Think about a subdivision or a condo project. In order to receive income from those projects, the developers had to sell their units to a buyer. Their business model was to sell the units for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Once they paid off their loans, they would have mountains of profits and life would be good. Well, when they borrowed money in 2007 and everything was great, they had no problem borrowing all that money. Real estate was at the highest price it had ever been and could only go up, right? Wrong. The prices of the products they were developing dropped and many of the buyers went away. These developers were now left with a product they couldn't sell and their debts on their project were due. Where did they go wrong? Well, hindsight is always 2020. but if these developers had gotten long-term debt and were building products that they were planning on renting out monthly instead of being sold one time, they would have had a much better chance of making it through the recession. Did you know that most self-storage and apartment buildings actually increased in value and produced more income during the recession? That's right. Some real estate actually performed better during the recession. Not all forms of real estate behave the same, and that's something you need to take away here. So let's come back around to the project I'm doing. My project will have long-term debt on it and won't be due for the next seven years. I'm building a product that I'm going to rent forever instead of selling it one time. I've also reduced my risk in this project because I've started to pre-lease the space, meaning I have customers already ready to pay me every single month before I actually spend any money on the construction. Is this making sense? Do you see how there's two sides of the coin when it comes to real estate development? There's going to be risk in any venture, but it's up to you to reduce your risk as much as possible, and that starts with educating yourself. So the pros of real estate development. You can make a lot of money if done right. You can build your desired investment where you want it, how you want it. The cons. There's many moving parts. It's a very long process. There's uncertainty. It requires a lot of education, and it's not always investing depending on your particular business plan and the strategy you're using. Section four, benefits of real estate deep dive. So you've read some benefits about different positions in real estates, but it's of utmost importance that you understand this section and what makes real estate so great. With the factor of many moving pieces, you need to understand each component of what makes real estate such an attractive investment. Let's do a deep dive on each aspect. Chapter 20, cash flow is king. Personally, this is my favorite part of real estate. Cash flow, as we described above, is when the income from the rent is greater than the expenses and mortgage payments on a property. This leaves you with excess money at the end of each month to put in your pocket. If you're a landlord, you love the first of the month because that's when rents do. And that means you're going to get another round of cash flow no matter where you are in the world or what you're doing. Robert Kiyosaki talks about how he had $50,000 and wanted to get a Porsche, but he didn't want to spend all his cash on the car. He knew the car was going to go down in value once he started driving it. If he had just bought the car with the money, it would have looked like this. Now in the book, I have a, a picture of a person who's putting money into a car of $50,000. And this would take money out of his pocket, and we would call this a liability because it's taking money out of his pocket. So instead of spending his money on the car, he went out and bought an investment property with $50,000. He then went and got a loan on the car. Now he had an asset that produced monthly cash flow that made his car payment for him and put extra gas money in his pocket each month. This is using an asset to pay for a liability, and this is what the rich do. So in the book, I have a picture of a person putting $50,000 into a house and then the house buying the car for the person rather than the person just putting the money directly into the car. 
He used the power of cash flow to get himself a free Porsche. He did not have to make monthly payments. He let his property do that for him. Cash flow is the gift that keeps on giving each and every month. Once you own an investment property, you get paid every month for the rest of your life through cash flow. And after the car was paid off, he now had a free car and his property was going to continue paying him directly instead of paying for his car. Cash flow format looks like this. Income minus expenses minus debt equals cash flow. Cash flow is residual income. It's doing the work one time and getting paid forever for it. Of course, there's a small amount of work you'll have to do every month, but the majority of your time and effort will be upfront for the project. Then once you own it, you have a predictable income stream forever. Your goal should be to trade the cash you have now for cash flow in the future. To build wealth, you need to know that cash flow is better than cash. Once you switch from working for money at a job or flipping houses for a profit to earning residual cash flow, you've reached investor status and will join the ranks of the wealthy very quickly. Chapter 21, Property Appreciation. Some investors would argue with me that appreciation is better than cash flow. I love appreciation, but will not invest unless there's cash flow in a property first and foremost. Appreciation is a fancy word to describe an increase in a property value. We have seen tremendous amounts of appreciation in real estate from 2010 to 2020. If you purchased a piece of property for $100,000 five years ago, and today you could sell it for $150,000, it would have appreciated $50,000 or 50%. With this being said, appreciation is not guaranteed from year to year, but over time, property values have gone up in the long run. Appreciation can occur for many reasons. The first is inflation. Every year, the value of the dollar is supposed to go down by 2%. That's the target set up by the Federal Reserve. If the value of the dollar goes down, the value of the real estate goes up. This means that a house that was worth $100,000 should be worth $102,000 by the same day next year. The year after that, it should be worth $104,040. That's 102,000 times 1.02 for 102%. Did the value really go up or did the value of the dollar go down? Either way, the value of your properties are going to go up relative to the dollar over time. This is inflation. The next way that properties appreciate is through supply and demand. If you want extreme examples of this, look in the Bay Area of California. There are so many people wanting to live in that area, their real estate prices have gone through the roof. You'd be hard-pressed to find a nice home in that area for under a million dollars. So when you buy in an area that people are moving to, and there's a lot of competition for that piece of property, whether it be residential or commercial, you'll find that prices go up and you benefit from appreciation if you're the property owner. The best way for you to take advantage of appreciation is to force it. In real estate, there's a type of investing called value-add investing. Just like it sounds, you're investing with the intention to add value to the property. You're going to force the property to appreciate. How is this done? Well, in the case of a residential property, you'll want to make it more desirable place to live, so people will pay you more for it in rent. You could change out the old countertops with new granite countertops, tear out some of the walls, add some landscaping to make it look nice like the people on TV do. This is what house flippers do, but you can do it to increase the rents you'll receive on a property, thereby increasing the value of it. There's a whole chapter coming up on commercial value add, but here's a little sneak peek. Commercial real estate is valued based off of how much income it produces after the expenses. So when the income goes up, the value of the property goes up. In order to force appreciation and drive up how much the property is worth, we need to find a way to either increase the amount of income we receive, decrease the expenses, or do both. By making a property look and feel nicer, we can generally charge more for it in rent, increase the income, and from there we'll have a property that has appreciated. This is the kind of appreciation real estate investors love. If you can assemble a business plan to force appreciation and you have a cash flow at the time of purchase, you have a great deal on your hands. Chapter 22, use your investment. Real estate, as we talked about earlier while comparing it to stocks, is awesome because you can touch it and you can use it. Your piece of real estate will always carry some utility and benefit. If the price of it drops, did your real estate really become less valuable? In the crash of 2008, when the value of houses dropped, did those houses really become less valuable? Think about this. On paper they did, but did a house lose its square footage and become smaller? Did the granite countertops become less stable? Did the roof of the house start to leak and allow water to come in? Did you lose a bedroom and have to kick a roommate out because there wasn't enough space in the house? Of course not. Real estate is amazing because it has profit potential, but it also has real-world benefits that will make your life better. This is why real estate will always be worth something, no matter what happens. It's because it's usable and it has utility. Chapter 23, Grow Your Equity. 
Different than appreciation, we have equity building up in our property each month that comes from a reduced loan balance. Equity is the difference between what a property is worth and how much we owe on that property. So the property value minus your debt equals your equity. So let's say that we have in year one a property that's worth $100,000. We borrowed $80,000 from a bank. $100,000 minus $80,000 equals $20,000 of equity. As your debt goes down, the amount of money you have in the property goes up, even if the actual value of the property doesn't go up. This benefit comes from your tenants paying your mortgage bill each month. Each time they pay rent, they are paying for the mortgage instead of you. Some of this money will go towards interest, but other goes towards paying down the amount owed to the bank. If you buy a property, make your loan payment each month for five years, then sell the property for the same amount you bought it for, you'll walk away with a profit because you now owe less money to the bank than you did when you first bought the property. So let's take that same property that we bought in year one that had an $80,000 loan balance. And let's say in year five, the value of the house is still $100,000, but now we only owe the bank $60,000. So $100,000 minus $60,000 equals $40,000 worth of equity. Yeah, that's right. You made $20,000, the difference between $40,000 and $20,000, but the value of the property didn't go up at all. By the way, that money's not considered a profit, so you get to keep all of it tax-free. Chapter 24, Make Inflation Your Friend. Inflation is a real estate investor's best friend. Inflation is a secret tax the government puts on you without you realizing it. Each year, they want your dollar to decrease in value by 2%. They do this by putting more money into the economy each year. When the Fed prints money, the dollars you have become less valuable because there are more of them in the system. As the rule of supply and demand tells us, the more of something there is, the less valuable it is. We can't do anything to stop this and to stop the dollar in our bank accounts from becoming less valuable each and every day. But we want to use this to our advantage. You see, when you borrow money from a bank, they tell you what your payment is going to be each month for the next 15 to 30 years. You can then use that money whose payment is at a fixed rate to go out and buy cash flow producing real estate. When you buy real estate the right way, you're going to have cash flow at the end of each month. Now you own a product that you sell to your customers each and every month. You're selling them space. That's your product. Well, just like the price of milk or gas goes up with inflation, so does rent. The amount your customers are going to pay each month for your space will go up over time as a result of inflation. Let's say you own and rent out a house for $1,000 a month. Your expenses are going to be $200 a month and the bank payment is $400 a month. That will put your monthly cash flow for the property at $400. That's $1,000 minus $200 minus $400 equals $400. And that's $4,800 a year. So let's also say that inflation is at 2% a year. Your rent's going to increase and your expenses are also going to increase, but your debt payment to the bank, which is your biggest expense, is going to stay the same. Because you lock in your debt payments when you first get a loan, that amount is not going to go up with inflation. It's locked. Let's take a look at your cash flow projections. Now guys, I'm on page 60 of the physical book here. There are some charts. I would highly recommend that you go look at the charts on page 60 to understand how inflation impacts your cash flow over time. If you go look at the charts, you can see from year one to year two that our income increases by 2%, our expenses increase by 2%, but our debt payment stays the exact same. This results in our monthly cash flow going up by 4%. The reason being is that our income, which goes up by 2%, is a larger line item than our expenses. So if they both go up 2%, but your income line item is bigger, the raw volume of that going up is going to increase your cash flow percentage by more than 2%. Take a look at the power using inflation to increase rents and lock it in your bank payment over a 10-year period. Again, go take a look at this chart on the bottom of page 60. Notice in this chart how your rent and your expenses increase every year, but your debt payments stay the same. Most people ignore this, but it's one of the most powerful features of real estate investing. What you've done by borrowing bank money and putting it into cash flow real estate is put yourself on the right side of inflation. The bank does not get a larger payment when inflation occurs, but as a real estate owner, you get benefit from rising rents and more cash flow each year. Now, not only are you winning because your cash flow is going to increase each year, but you've also taken the winning side of inflation due to your debt going down every year and the value of your property increasing. Again, the difference between what your property is worth and how much you owe is called equity. Let's say you buy a house for $100,000 using a financing program that allows you to put none of your own money into it. In the beginning, you will owe exactly what the property is worth and you will have no equity. It will be all debt. 
So if we went out and bought a house for $100,000 and we borrowed all $100,000 on it, our equity would look like this. The property value minus the debt equals equity. Well, the property value is 100000 the debt's 100000 so the equity is zero. This is when we first buy it. And take a look at the chart on page 61 if you're in the physical book, and let's see what happens of how inflation impacts your equity. What happens after a year passes and we own the home? The first thing is the home value is going to rise by 2% due to inflation. But we're also going to have our debt reduced on the property. Look at the chart. In year two, we've made a total of $4,000 in equity in two ways. First, we made $2,000 by the value of the property going up. Next, we made $2,000 by the amount that we owe to the bank going down. Take a look at the power of this over a 10-year time period. In this example, if you would have bought a property for $100,000 and borrowed all the money to buy it in 10 years, you would have $37,509 of equity. This is the difference between what the property is worth and what you owe the bank. This is your money, and again, it's called equity. Not only did you enjoy the cash flow, but you're also building up a large amount of equity because you put yourself on the right side of inflation. This is extremely powerful. The combination of inflation pushing equity and cash flow is why so much wealth is built in real estate. Please note that our debt does not go down in a straight line like I just talked about from 100000 to 2000 uh, I just use round numbers for this simple illustration. Section 8 of this book is going to get in a deep dive of how debt decreases. Before the year 2000, people who saved money were smart. They were winners because they saved money, put it in the bank, and earned a good rate of return. Today, we're operating under old advice that's no longer useful. In fact, saving money is a bad thing to do these days, and it's what the financially illiterate are doing. If you want to learn more about why savers are now losers, visit HaydenCrabtree.com forward slash resources to watch a quick video of exactly what this means. The rules of the game have changed, and most people aren't even aware that they're losing. The intention of this section was to open your eyes to all the different ways real estate benefits its owners. We're going to examine these topics to get a better understanding of their true power and to give you more detail. Were you aware of all these benefits that real estate has? These benefits are the reason that rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. The benefits of real estate are one reason the divide between the rich and the poor is larger than it's ever been. Put yourself on the right side of the equation and take advantage of these seven benefits and become wealthy. Section 5, Residential versus Commercial. This is my favorite chapter. The real reason behind writing this book and calling it Skip to Flip is because I talk to so many people on a weekly basis who want to get into real estate investing. But these people are misguided. They think that they should flip a house and that'll make them investors. They don't have their attention in the correct niche. If they could absorb the information in this book, they would put themselves five to ten years ahead of where they are now and shorten their learning curve to real estate success. My goal is to shorten your time frame and help you become successful quicker. The advice, there are no shortcuts, is bad advice. There are shortcuts to success in this world. By listening to this book, you're taking a shortcut. By finding a mentor, you're taking a shortcut. This chapter is a real estate investing shortcut that will save you time, money, and energy. Residential real estate is where many people get their start because it's easier. Commercial real estate seems to have this mental roadblock for most people and few ever push into the bigger properties. This chapter is going to tell you why you should skip residential and go straight for bigger commercial properties and how doing so will increase your investing success. Chapter 25, Commercial versus Residential Risk. A main takeaway for you to remember is that commercial real estate has less risk than residential does. In commercial real estate, you can reduce your risk by having many tenants instead of one tenant. In residential real estate, such as a house, you have one customer. You're relying on one tenant to pay your rent. In commercial real estate, you have many tenants. This drastically reduces your risk because your income is coming from many different sources. Think about it this way. If you have expenses of $200 a month and a mortgage payment of $600 a month, that's $800 a month in expenses. If your tenant pays rent of $1,000 a month, you make a positive $200 in cash flow. That's a 20% margin. But what does your life look like when the unexpected happens? What if your tenant loses their job, gets injured, or moves out? Who's going to pay the $800 a month in expenses? That's right, you are. That's a risk, so how do we reduce it? Well, let's look at a commercial property, say a 100-unit apartment complex. The apartment complex now has 100 tenants instead of just one. You have now diversified your income source. Now you're not relying on one person to pay your expenses for you. Instead, you're relying on 100 people. What happens if one person moves out, one person gets injured, and another loses their job? These three people may not pay you, but the other 97 will pay. You'll have all your expenses paid for and still get some positive cash flow in your pocket. 
like the example of the one house where you have a 20% margin, you'll also have a 20% margin on the larger 100 unit complex. That will come out to $20,000 a month in positive cash flow. In this case, if you had three people not pay their rent, you wouldn't make the 20000 but you'd still make $17,000 in positive cash flow. By adding volume to your income and having income come in from many sources, you have some room in your profit margin for unexpected things to happen and still have cash flow. The reality of investing is that you have to deal with people and some people in this world don't live up to their promises or have bad things happen inside their own lives that cause them not to perform the way they should. That doesn't mean you shouldn't get started in investing because sometimes people aren't going to pay. What it does mean is that you should be aware of the risks and prepare your strategy accordingly. By buying properties that rely on 10 or more tenants instead of one, you've reduced your risk of having to pay for the expenses out of pocket when a tenant or two doesn't make their rent payment. This is a major key that many first-time investors overlook when they decide to rent out their first house. They get discouraged when it sits vacant for a month or two or nobody rents it. They get down on themselves when their tenant runs into financial hardship and they can't make their rent payment and they, as the owner of the property, still have to make the power, insurance, and property tax payments. Be aware of this pitfall from the start and protect yourself from this risk by investing in properties that have a diverse income source and multiple tenants. Chapter 26, add A players to your team. The next reason you should invest in commercial over residential is because of how much more income the properties bring in. This is not just a benefit because you'll make more money, but it's also a benefit because you can spread the love around. When your property brings in $1,000 to $2,000 a month, you can't afford to hire anyone full-time to help you manage that property. Hiring anyone is going to cost more than what you can afford because any salary or wages you pay is going to eat into your cash flow. This means you have to do everything yourself. Not good. Trust me, life is much better as an investor when you can have other people help manage your properties and take on responsibilities for you. This is the whole point of investing, being able to do what you want and have your money work for you. If you have a 100-unit apartment complex at $1,000 rent per unit, that property will be bringing in around 100000 a month. Now, your expenses and debt payments will be much bigger. At this scale, you will be able to afford to pay someone 5000 a month to be a manager on the property for you. This will allow you to go look for another property to buy instead of having to watch over the property all the time. In residential real estate, you're going to have to pay people less and therefore will not be able to hire high-quality people who can help you grow your business. A key lesson to learn, not just in real estate but in any business, is that people always come first. No matter what you're doing, you're going to have to deal with people, and you want to surround yourself with high-quality, smart people who can help you on your mission. Chapter 27, Control Your Value. What is the difference between how residential real estate and commercial real estate is valued? How do we determine how much we could sell the property for? Residential real estate is valued based off of supply and demand. Essentially, what someone who wants to live in the house is willing to pay for it is what it's worth. You could have the same exact house, but if the house is in North Dakota, it's going to be worth far less money than it would be if it were in Beverly Hills, California, or Manhattan in New York. This is because less people want to live in North Dakota than they do Beverly Hills or Manhattan. It's the same house, but there are more people wanting to live there, therefore the demand is higher and the price is higher. Same house different value. But how is commercial real estate valued? The next chapter takes a deep dive into this, but the short answer is that commercial real estate is valued off of how much money it makes. That's because commercial real estate is an investment. It's less emotional and more of a business decision. If we can raise the income of a commercial property, it's going to be worth more. Period. No debating that fact. However, if we redo a kitchen and a house, is it going to be worth a predictable amount more? Some will say yes, but at the end of the day, it's only going to be worth what the end home buyer wants to pay for it. The difference in these valuation methods is called income approach versus comparable sales approach. In the income approach, we value the property based on its income. The higher the income, the higher the value. The lower the income, the lower the value. On the comparable sales approach, we look at properties like ours and see what they're selling for. The problem to me with the comparable sales approach is that the value of my property is determined by other people in other transactions. There's only so much I can do to increase the value of my property. What happens if someone in the other transaction was a bad negotiator and they got a lower price for the house than they should have? That affects the value of my property negatively. This is why you should choose properties where you can control the income and thus control the value. Most investors don't understand this key difference when they first start. Most people generally never understand this concept, so congratulations, you're ahead of 99% of the population just because you listen to this section. Section 6, Value in Commercial Property. Hooray! You now get to learn how to value commercial property. This is a skill that will be valuable for you throughout your entire life. After listening to this chapter, you will quickly be able to look at a commercial property for sale and have a good idea of how much the property is worth. 
You're also going to learn a little secret that commercial property brokers use to know if you're a rookie or not and how you can use this to your advantage in purchasing a property. Chapter 28, Net Operating Income, also known as NOI. There are two main factors that impact the value of commercial real estate. The first is the net operating income. The NOI of a property is determined by the following formula. Income minus expenses equals net operating income. It's that easy. The NOI of a property is very easily determined. All we're looking for is income minus expenses. Wow, Hayden, it's that easy? You're asking me? All I have to do is look at the cash flow and that'll tell me how much the property's worth? Well, not exactly. I always have to reply, taking the excitement out of whoever I'm talking to. You see, cash flow and NOI are not the same thing. There's one big difference. Chapter 29, cash flow. Cash flow is calculated using the following formula. Income minus expenses equals NOI. Now that we have NOI, our NOI minus our debt service is equal to our cash flow. As a note, debt service is just a really fancy word for making bank payments. Whatever we pay to the bank for our monthly mortgage is also called debt service. So to reiterate, income minus expenses equals NOI. NOI minus debt service equals cash flow. Net operating income is valuing the property before we make any debt payments. The reason for this is we do not have to use the bank to help us buy the property. If we want to, and we have enough money, we could use all of our own money to buy a property, and we wouldn't have to pay the bank anything. In the case that you do not use a bank, your cash flow would equal your NOI. But you're missing out on many of the benefits that real estate provides if you do use a bank's money. You're shooting yourself in the foot and slowing down your business growth if you only use your own money. For that reason, many investors use a lender's money. So you're asking, if almost everyone uses a bank's money, we can come to the same number for a value of the property if we use both NOI and cash flow, right? Chapter 30, why we use NOI instead of cash flow for value. I always have to respond to the previous question, no, not exactly. If we had identical properties that looked like the following, income of 100,000, expenses of 40,000, NOI of 60,000, and we have two different investors who both bought the same copy of that property, they could have different cash flows even though the property NOI is the same and the value of the property is the same. Why is that? Well, let's say one of the property buyers is you and the other property buyer is Warren Buffett. Now, I don't know you, but I'd be willing to bet you're not in a better financial position than Warren Buffett is. You see, when we go to the bank, they look at us and ask themselves, how risky is this person? If you're risky, they're going to charge you a higher interest rate. The interest rate is a reflection of risk. The interest rate is the cost of the money. The higher the interest rate, the more you're going to have to pay for the money you borrowed. When the risk is higher, the bank is going to want to make more money for taking that risk. So for the two borrowers, you and Warren Buffett, who's going to present more risk to the bank? The bank is going to define risk as what are my chances of this money getting repaid on time? Warren is a very low risk because they know he's good for the money. He has a track record of doing well in investing and repaying his debts. You, on the other hand, present more risk than Warren because you're not a billionaire. That's okay, and you shouldn't get down on yourself for not being a billionaire. You'll get there one day. For now, you'll have to face the facts that you're going to get a higher interest rate than Warren is. That's not a bad thing, and it doesn't mean you shouldn't take the bank's money. It's just how finance works. Now, back to our example. Because Warren can get a lower interest rate than you, this is what his cash flow is going to look like. Again, NOI minus debt service equals cash flow. For this property, we had a $60,000 NOI. And we're going to say Warren's debt service was $10,000. So $60,000 minus $10,000 equals $50,000 of cash flow. On this property, Warren's going to have $10,000 of debt payments and his cash flow is going to be $50,000. Because you're riskier than Warren, you'll have a higher interest rate, but the bank is still going to lend you the money. You borrow the same amount of money as Warren's, but your debt payments are $15,000 instead of $10,000. Here's what your cash flow looks like. Again, the NOI on the property is 60000 Your debt service is 15000 60000 minus 15000 is $45,000 of cash flow. So you had to pay $5,000 more than Warren, even though you both borrowed the same amount of money. The property is worth the same amount, and the NOI was the same, but you paid that extra $5,000 because the bank wanted more money from you because you were a bigger risk than Warren. In finance and investing, there's a general rule that goes as follows. The higher the risk of a project, the higher return is required. The lower the risk of a project, the lower return is required. All this comes back to the whole reason why we use NOI instead of cash flow to value a property. It wouldn't be fair for Warren's property to be worth more just because he's a better borrower in the eyes of the bank than we are. 
It's the same property, but the cash flows are different because of our personal situation as an investor. By using the NOI to value the property, we level the playing field for anyone who wants to buy or sell properties. We have to value the property based on the merits and performance of the property itself, not what kind of return it will provide to one investor over another. There is an advantage for investors like Warren. We call this credit worthy. This means a bank likes to lend to you if you're credit worthy because you're a lower risk. For someone who is credit worthy, they're going to be able to achieve a higher cash flow out of the exact same property than someone who's not credit worthy and has to pay a higher interest rate. For someone who is credit worthy, they're going to be able to achieve a higher cash flow out of the exact same property than someone who is not credit worthy and has to pay a higher interest rate. Is all this making sense? Do you understand what the NOI is and why we use the NOI instead of cash flow to value a property? If this doesn't make sense, I want to invite you to reach out to my personal Instagram page at Hayden Crabtree. Direct message me what I can help you with. Okay, this is crucial you understand NOI to all of your real estate investing journey. Just want to recap before we move on. NOI is income minus expenses. Our cash flow is NOI minus our debt service. Chapter 31, Determining Value. Now that you understand NOI, you're probably wondering how to use it to determine the value of a property. We'll keep the example above and get rid of our debt service because we don't need that to value a property. As a reminder, the income is 100000 the expenses are 40000 so that makes the NOI 60000 First thing to understand is that the NOI is used on an annual basis. There are two ways to look at it. If you want, you can say, what was the income last year from January 1st to December 31st? The next way to look at it would be for the last 12 months. So if we're in July of 2019, we could look at the last 12 months performance from June 2018 to June 2019. The advantage of doing it this way is you'll see the most recent numbers instead of dated numbers. I always prefer to look at the most recent trailing 12 months instead of January to December. All right, so I got a caution here. There's a little bit of a math upcoming. I promise this math is very, very easy, so stick with me. Again, if you want to grab the physical copy, you can get a free copy at HaydenCrabtree.com forward slash free book. And we are currently on page 82, about to go into page 83. So if you're listening to this and you want to do some math on paper, go pick up a free copy of the book, HaydenCrabtree.com forward slash free book. All right, now that we know we're about to do some math. Now, what we want is to determine what level of return we want for the property. So if we want a 10% return on our property, we can take the NOI and divide it by our return to get a value. If we know how much NOI a property has and we know how much return we want from that property, we have a very easy math equation to figure out what the value of that property is. All we have to do is divide our income by the return we want and we'll come up with how much we should pay for the property. So let's say we want a 10% return on our money. We just divide the NOI by the return we want to get the value. So in this example, if we wanted to get the value of the property with the $60,000 NOI and we wanted a 10% return, all we would do is take the $60,000 and divide it by 10%. The value of this property would be $600,000. This makes sense because we want to get a 10% return on our property and this property makes $60,000 a year in NOI. $60,000 is 10% of $600,000. Seems pretty simple, right? Well, I wish it was that easy. Unfortunately, we don't get to decide what return we want and the value of the property. How it really works is like this. A property type is assigned a level of risk by the market. For example, the market could say that apartment complexes are lower risk than office space. The market could be saying this for whatever reason. The market could say this could be because more people want to live in apartments and work from home, causing there to be more apartment rental customers than office space renters. When we reference the market, what we're talking about is what's actually happening between buyers and sellers in transactions. It's the collective price that buyers are willing to pay for something and sellers are willing to sell for. That's what the market is. So just like the example between Warren and you, the lower risk option is always going to be rewarded. For this example, let's say the market tells us the office space is worthy of a 10% return. And because the apartments are less risky, they only need to have a 5% return. So if this $60,000 NOI belonged to office space, the value would be $60,000 divided by 10% equals $600,000. If this NOI belonged to apartments, we'd have the $60,000 NOI divided by 5% equals $1.2 million of value. To do this for yourself, just simply take $60,000 in your calculator and divide it by 0.1 for the office space. Take $60,000 and divide it by 0.05 and you'll get the answer of your value. While the properties have the same NOI, they have different values. This is because of the risk associated with one investment over another. This may seem like a typo, but it isn't. 
if you've ever heard anyone talk about multiplying money, this is what they're referring to. It's very powerful. Chapter 32, cap rate. You see, the percent we're dividing the NOI by has a name. This is called the capitalization rate, or for short, cap rate. The cap rate is extremely powerful, and it's how you can make a large amount of money in commercial real estate. You need to remember the cap rate and what it is. It's one of the most important factors in all of real estate. When you're selling a property, a low cap rate is good because you're going to get a higher price for every dollar of NOI. If you're buying a property, you generally want a higher cap rate because this means you're getting a good deal. But this is not a hard and fast rule. Sometimes an extremely high cap rate can mean something is wrong with the property and you may not want to own it. A low cap rate equals lower risk equals every dollar of NOI is more valuable. A higher cap rate is higher risk and every dollar of NOI is less valuable. So take a look at the chart below to see what a property with a $60,000 annual NOI could be worth depending on the cap rate used. The property produces the same NOI but can have a wide range of possible values. So the property can bring any of these wide ranges if it were to be sold. So I'm going to walk you through this chart here for the audio book. A $60,000 NOI on a 10% cap rate would be worth $600,000. A $60,000 NOI on a 9% cap rate would be worth $666,000. A $60,000 NOI on an 8% cap rate would be worth $750,000. A $60,000 NOI on a 7% cap rate would be worth $857,000. A $60,000 NOI on a 6% cap rate would be worth $1 million flat. A $60,000 NOI on a 5% cap rate would be worth $1.2 million. A $60,000 NOI on a 4% cap rate would be worth $1.5 million. A $60,000 NOI on a 3% cap rate would be worth $2 million. So you can do all these calculators on your own. Just pull out your calculator and divide $60,000 by each percentage to see the result for yourself. I want you to notice how the value between a 10% cap rate and a 9% cap rate is smaller than the difference between a 5% cap rate and a 4% cap rate. From a 10 cap to a 9 cap, the difference is only $66,000. But the difference from a 5 cap to a 4 cap, there's a $300,000 difference in value. It's very important to know the power of the cap rate. If you're buying a property and the market cap is 5%, but the seller tells you they want a 4% cap, the difference doesn't sound that big. To an untrained ear, it only sounds like they're asking a 1% difference. What's the big deal? It's only 1%, right? But in reality, the difference can be huge in how much you pay for a property or get paid for your property if you're selling it. The cap rate tells us what percent of the purchase price the NOI is going to be over a 12-month period. The cap rate can go up or down depending on the following factors that determine risk. Location of the property, type of the property, age of the property, property class, real estate market and cycle, and demand for that property type. Here's the pro tip. Here's the pro tip. Commercial property brokers know how to weed out newbies to the investing game by only posting a cap rate and an NOI on a property that they have for sale. That way, if someone calls and asks about the property and asks what the price is, the broker will know that the person they're talking with has never bought a piece of property before and is likely wasting their time. Any seasoned investor should know that with the cap rate and the NOI, you can determine the purchase price. You will not be taken as a serious buyer if you make this mistake. Chapter 33, Determining Your Cap Rate. Knowing that the cap rates are valuable, it's important to know how cap rates are determined. Let's talk about how and why cap rates vary. Location. Generally, if we have an apartment complex in Manhattan and the same apartment complex in Alaska, the Alaska apartment is going to be riskier, so the cap rate is going to be higher. Less people living in Alaska means that there's fewer potential tenants, and that makes it riskier. Higher risk equals higher needed return, so we use a higher cap rate. There are many other factors such as growth, jobs, future expectations, and quality of living that play into location and how that determines an area cap rate. The location of your property is a big factor on what cap rate is used. Property type. Property type goes back to my example about apartments versus office space. What kind of property it is will play a factor into what cap rate is used. If we see a trend from employees going into offices for work to being able to work from home, that means that businesses will stop renting office space now because it's no longer needed. With less potential renters in the market, the office space will become higher risk because of the income uncertainty. When there are fewer people who want your office space, it will become more risky. Same goes for retail space. With so much shopping done online these days, we have seen more and more purchases done on the internet and less people going into stores to complete a purchase. If people stop buying in stores and only buy online, we'll not need stores anymore. 
This will make storefront real estate less valuable and more risky as an investment. Age. Older properties will in general have higher cap rates than new properties. This is because older properties are higher risk than newer ones. Older properties have functional obsolescence and higher probability of needing physical repair. A new property is going to have a new roof and does not present a risk of needing the roof replaced during ownership. So when we buy older properties, they carry a greater risk of repairs needed. This means more money being spent during ownership and will result in a higher cap rate than their new counterparts. Property class. Have you ever been in an area that you wouldn't let your mom walk by herself at night? Yeah, that's a D or a C class area. You ever been to Las Vegas and walk down the strip or in Times Square in New York? That's an A class area. In real estate, we rank from A to D with A being most desirable and D being least desirable. An A class property will have a lower cap rate because it's lower risk and a D class property will have a higher cap rate because it's higher risk. When comparing in general, the people who are going to rent from you in a D-class area are more likely to cause damage and not care for your property than an A-class area, leading to more unexpected repair costs and therefore risk. The real estate market. This comes to the real estate market in 2018 versus the real estate market in 2008. In 2008, properties that were selling for 10 caps were selling for 5 caps in 2018. As real estate markets cycle from low demand to high demand, the values are going to change whether the NOI changes or not. There are many reasons for real estate cycles, but the general rule of thumb is how good the economy is, both in the United States and globally. The better the economy does, the more money the citizens and businesses are going to have, and the more money they'll have to buy real estate. Having money and the ability to buy things is called liquidity, and liquidity is very important in real estate. If nobody has liquidity, then they can't buy real estate, and that's going to hurt prices. When investors do have liquidity, they're more likely to buy real estate, and that's good for prices. Again, supply and demand. The more buyers in the market, the higher the price. The fewer the buyers in the market, the lower the price. This is basic supply and demand. Interest rates. Interest rates are set by the Federal Reserve, aka the Fed, in America. This is not a government entity, although they work very closely with the government. When things are going poorly in the economy, the Federal Reserve will typically lower interest rates. This lowers the cost of money for everyone and allows businesses to get cheaper money. If they have cheaper money, it means they can borrow more money to invest in their business for less than interest payments. So when business growth slows or comes to a stop, the Fed lowers interest rates for the whole country. Because banks get their money from the Fed, when the Fed lowers interest rates, they can pass those lower rates along to us as investors. Well, when interest rates go down, cap rates go down too. There's a general spread between interest rates and cap rates. For example, if interest rates are at 5%, then cap rates will typically be slightly higher at, say, 7%. Now, if interest rates drop to 4%, then cap rates will start to slide to 6% as more buyers are looking to use lower interest rates to purchase properties. This is an advanced topic, but it's worth learning about. Chapter 34, Power of the Cap Rate. Let me give you a quick example of how powerful the cap rate is. At an apartment complex I lived at in Atlanta, the owners implemented a policy where they would take your trash out for you. It was a service where they would come around every night and pick up the trash outside your door and take it to the dumpster for you. This was a mandatory policy they implemented, and it costed an extra $25 a month, less than a dollar a day for each tenant. While this doesn't seem like a whole lot of money, there are 196 units of that complex. So the extra income the apartment brings in is going to be 196 units times $25 a month times 12 months. This comes out to $58,800 a year. But let's say the owner of the apartment had to hire somebody to do the labor every night, and this labor takes two hours a day at $20 an hour. So that's $40 a day at 365 days a year. This comes out to $14,600 a year of extra expenses to take this trash out. So the income from this was $58,800. The expenses from this are $14,600. Our income minus our expenses equals our NOI. In this case, the owners added an extra $44,200 to their NOI. Let's say the market for these types of apartments is around a 6% cap rate. How much did the owner add to the value of the property? Well, to do this, we're going to take the additional NOI of $44,200, divide it by the market cap rate of 6%, and here's what we're going to get. While the $25 a month doesn't look like much to a single tenant, by implementing this program, the owner of these apartments made an extra $736,000. The value of this property goes up by $736,000, almost three quarters of a million dollars, after the first month of implementing this policy at the apartment complex. And the owner of the complex will be able to put that extra cash in his pocket if he were to sell the property. 
I hope you're getting this. It's so extremely powerful, and this is how fortunes are made in real estate. Now, if the owner of the property didn't sell it and he decided to keep it, he would still enjoy an extra $44,200 in cash flow every year or an extra $3,600 a month just from having someone take the trash out. Now that you know how to value commercial real estate, to further your knowledge, it'll be very helpful for you to actually work through a couple of examples on how to do this for yourself. I created three examples with an answer key you can download for free at HaydenCrabtree.com forward slash resources. Also in that download, I'll give you a Google Sheet template that will help you out with the math. Section 7, Tax Benefits. When most people turn the page to a chapter called Tax Benefits, they most likely yawn and put the book back on the shelf or skip the chapter entirely. But you're going to continue listening because you're going to learn how that $736,000 of profit the owner made in the last section can be completely tax-free. Sound good? Sound worthwhile? All right, stick with me because in this section, like the last, it's going to change your life. All right, stick with me because this section, like the last, will change your life. Chapter 35, Why Real Estate Investors Get Tax Benefits. There are four main tax benefits that come as a side effect of real estate that can change your financial life. But before we get into the nitty gritty, let's first understand why. Why do real estate owners get tax benefits? It seems like real estate is already juicy enough that people would be interested in investing in it and owning it that we don't really need the icing on the cake. Well, that's probably true, but the government has decided that it wants to make sure we're interested. They want to be sure that our spare money goes into real estate investing instead of other places we could put our money. The government also wants to be sure that we buy U.S. real estate to stimulate our economy rather than real estate in Europe, South America, or somewhere else that they give great benefits. You see, the government puts out a playbook that guides our taxes called the tax code. Now, some people see the tax code and look at all the ways the government is trying to take your money away from you. But when real estate investors look at the tax code, they look at it as a playbook, an instruction manual. The government puts out the tax code and gives incentives for things they want to happen. If the government wants us to buy a house, they give an incentive where you can deduct your interest expense on homes from your taxable income. If they want us to donate to charity, they give us a tax break there too. The four main parts of the big tax breaks for real estate are incentives the government gives us because they want us to provide real estate space for rent. If you try and fight the tax code, you will lose. If you make the tax code your friend, you will win. Some people think that paying taxes is their patriotic duty. The opposite is true. If you're paying taxes, that means you are not doing what your government wants you to do to help the nation. Paying taxes is a penalty. Paying no taxes should be your goal. Yes, it is possible to pay no taxes at all. In fact, I know many people making millions a year and paying zero in taxes annually. Zero. None. The same can be true for you. The truth is, not paying taxes is more patriotic than paying taxes because you're helping your government out by giving its citizens apartments to rent, storage units to store in, office space to work in, medical space for doctors to use, and grocery stores to shop in. The government wants to cut you a tax break, so let's learn how we can make our government happy. Chapter 36, Depreciation is Your Friend. What most people think of is not the kind of depreciation we're talking about. We're not talking about what happens to a new car's value when you drive it off the lot for the first time. That's bad depreciation. We want good depreciation. As mentioned earlier, when you buy an investment property, the IRS is going to recognize that the building is going to break down a little bit each and every year. The slow deterioration over time of a building is why we are awarded depreciation. The IRS tells us that buildings that people are going to live in will go from full value to zero dollar value over 27 and a half years. They tell us properties that people do not live in will go down over 39 years. The following chart will show us how much we can write off every year on a $1 million building. Looking at this chart for both residential and commercial properties, we can see how much we get to depreciate. We bought the properties for a million dollars. For the residential property, we get to take a million dollars and divide it by 27.5. This will give us $36,364 we can take as an expense each year. For commercial, we take the same $1 million and divide it by 39 to get $25,641 of expense each year. Now guys, if you're listening to this audiobook, we are on page 100. There is a chart you should definitely go check out. Again, HaydenCrabtree.com forward slash free book to take a look at this page 100. One thing that I want to show you here is what's called the basis. Now, let's say we bought the property for a million dollars and it's a residential property. So we get to take out $36,000 in the first year. The basis would be $1 million minus that $36,000 we depreciated. And our basis is going to be a running total. It's going to go down each and every year. So go take a look at that chart on page 100. The numbers in the basis column represent the original purchase price minus the depreciation. This is called the basis and it's a way to see how much more we'll get to take as depreciation expense in the future. 
to calculate the basis for residential at the end of year one, we take a million minus 36,000 and we get $963,636. To calculate the basis for a commercial property, we take a million dollars minus 25,641 to give us a basis at the end of year one for 974,359. Looking at the next chart for year two, you'll see that the same $36,364 for residential and $25,641 for commercial. The basis at the end of year two will be the basis from the end of year one minus how much we took in year two. Again, if you're listening to the audio book, go look at page 100 to get a full picture of this. For the residential property, we took a total of $363,000 of depreciation over 10 years. This means that over a 10 year period, we could have made $363,000 in profit and not had to pay any taxes on it. For the commercial property over 10 years, we took a total of $256,410 depreciation. This means that over that 10 year period, we could have made $256,000 of profit and not had to pay any taxes on it. On a million dollar building that people use as homes, on a $1 million that people use as homes, or also known as dwellings, we get to take $36,364 each year as an expense. But did we really pay that $36,000 to anyone? The answer is no. Because the government wants us to own these buildings, they allow us to take this expense. The amount we would get taxed on for this investment from the previous chapter would look like this. If we purchased the dwelling for a million dollars, it had an NOI of $60,000, we would do this equation. NOI of $60,000 minus depreciation of $36,000 a year gives us a $23,636 taxable amount. If it was a commercial property that had a $60,000 NOI, we'd simply take the $60,000 NOI minus the depreciation of $25,641 for a commercial property to get a taxable amount of $34,359. To make this clear, the depreciation is not an actual expense. We paid no money out of our pocket for depreciation. Isn't that great? We get to take the full depreciation amount each year as if we'd spent that money on an expense when we really didn't. This is tax-free cash straight into our pocket. If this sounds awesome, wait for the next section on cost segregation. As you can see, the government wants us to invest in housing or dwelling buildings more than other assets. The government is most worried about its citizens having housing than it is other space, so they give us bigger tax breaks on dwellings so we as investors will focus our attention there. See how this is an incentive? Before we move on, notice that the column labeled basis. This is the amount left in the property at the end of each year that you can depreciate. This is important to know because once that basis reaches zero, you run out of depreciation. As you can see on the chart above, you calculate your basis by subtracting your previous year's basis minus how much depreciation you use this year. It's also worth noting that when you buy a property, the government will only let you depreciate the buildings. You cannot depreciate land. When you buy a property, you'll have to split the purchase price up between how much of the purchase price was for the land and how much was for the buildings, also known as improvements. Chapter 37, Depreciation Steroids. This is where tax benefits get juicy, so grab a highlighter. Building off of what we just learned about depreciation, the government wanted to make it even sweeter for us as investors. Now, this is actually a pro tip as I talk to many investors who've never heard about this strategy. It's called accelerated depreciation, which is done through a cost segregation study. Here's the general logic behind this. The government will let us depreciate a dwelling over 27 and a half years, but realistically, not everything in the building deteriorates at the same pace. You see, a roof is going to last, say, 15 years, and the floors are only going to last five years. The walls are going to last four years, but the foundation is going to last 40 years. You get the point. Not everything breaks down at the same pace. So what we're allowed to do is go hire a professional to do a cost segregation study on our property. In this study, they go through and look at each and every individual component of a building. They look at the concrete, they look at the wood in the walls, the wires running to the lights, the pipes to the sink, the shower tiles. Then they depreciate everything at their own pace. It may say that wood is going to last three years, so let's take the value of that wood and instead of breaking it out over 27 and a half years, let's break it out over three years. The study may also say that electrical wiring is going to last five years, so instead of waiting 27 and a half years, let's break that out and depreciate the value of the wire over five years. This is really just a tax game that we're playing. Even if we depreciate wood in three years and our wires in five years, we really expect for those items to be working fine in three or five years. We simply want to get as much depreciation as we possibly can. What this does is take a large bulk of your depreciation and moves it in the first couple of years. This is a huge benefit. This study does have to be done by a professional, but it's worth the cost. You can find a pro by googling cost segregation study real estate.
I've personally seen up to 40% of the purchase price written off in year one as an expense. From the example in the previous section, let's take 40% of the million dollar piece of property. So our NOI was 60000 and our accelerated depreciation for year one is 40% of a million. That comes out to 400000 So to get our taxable amount, we're going to take 60000 and subtract out 400000 That's going to give us a negative $360,000 taxable amount. Yes, you heard that right. We're going to show a $360,000 loss from this property just in year one. But did we actually lose $360,000? The answer is no. It's just showing up that way for tax purposes. We had a positive cash flow, but the government is going to recognize us as having lost money on the project in this year. So if you're a doctor or an engineer, guess what? You get to take this loss and move it over to your personal tax returns. From there, you'll get to subtract this off of your personal taxes, shielding your other income from taxes too. So if a doctor makes $500,000 from their practice, they'll get to write off $360,000. What that doctor will pay taxes on will look like the following. Their income from being a doctor is $500,000 minus their loss from the real estate investment of $360,000. 500000 minus 360000 equals $140,000. So yes, this doctor will still pay taxes, but instead of paying taxes on $500,000, they're only going to pay taxes on $140,000. Look at how much money he's saving. He was going to have to pay around $211,000 in taxes without depreciation. Now he's only going to have to pay around $45,000 in taxes after the depreciation. He's going to save $166,000 in taxes in just the first year. Using a bank, he would have only had to spend $200,000 of his own money to buy this million dollar property. He almost makes that entire amount back in the first year from tax savings alone, not to mention the cash flow he got from the property. In addition to that, he gets the equity buildup, appreciation, and cash flow all occurring at the same time. Major wealth is being built. What if you're an engineer that makes $70,000 a year? What would your taxes look like? So you have income from being an engineer of $70,000 minus your loss from your real estate investment of 360000 So your taxable income amount is 70000 minus $360,000. So your taxable amount is negative $290,000. That's right. The government is saying in that year you lost $290,000. So you're going to pay no taxes. In addition to that, you get to take your $290,000 loss and roll it forward to the next year. Your losses get to roll forward and protect next year's income as well. Losses get to carry forward each year, so you're not hurting your future self by taking as much depreciation as possible up front. Oh yeah, and every time you fix your building up, you get to reset the depreciation clock on that component of your building, resulting in even more depreciation. Do you understand the power of accelerated depreciation? Let's all be good citizens and buy some properties for the government so we don't have to pay any taxes. Does all this sound too good to be true or maybe even illegal? What about tax fraud? Listen, I beg you to call a qualified CPA and confirm all of this, like right now. Do it. Chapter 38, Tax-Free Property Swap. Some of you will not believe the content that's in this section. When we are talking about building up your real estate snowball, this could be the number one source of fuel on your fire. What we're talking about here is the 1031 exchange. Here's the concept. When we buy a property for a million dollars and sell it for 1.5 million 10 years later, we have a $500,000 gain from the original purchase price. But over those five years, we also took a massive amount of depreciation to shield our income. So let's say our basis on that property is only at $100,000. So if we sell this property, we have to pay taxes on the difference between the sales proceeds and the current basis. So we would be paying taxes on 1.5 million minus 100000 and the government would recognize us as making a $1.4 million gain. Zoinks. That is not good, and at this point, it makes depreciation sound a lot less enticing. This is where the 1031 exchange comes into play. The 1031 exchange allows you to take all those sales proceeds and buy another property with that money. As long as you buy a property with your sales proceeds, you don't have to pay any taxes on those gains. Yes, that's right. No taxes on your gains. So the apartment owner who implemented the trash program that made himself an extra $736,000 could take that profit and he could move it forward tax-free. He doesn't have to use any of his depreciation to shield this either. You can have depreciation and 1031. They're a great combination that can help you avoid paying taxes for the rest of your life. It's an awesome program if you understand it and know how to use it correctly. Let's say you buy a house for $100,000 and you use a low money down program. You put down 5% or $5,000. 
this house is a fixer upper and you think that after you do some work to it, live in it for a year, rent it out for a year, you can sell it for $200,000. When you sell it for $200,000, you'll owe the bank 90000 So you'll walk away with 200000 minus 90000 That comes out to $110,000 is how much you'll walk away with. Out of this $110,000, you'll have around $100,000 gain, which is taxable. That's the difference between $200,000 and the $100,000 you bought it for. Sounds pretty sweet. You could take that money and run, but you'd have to pay taxes on that $100,000 gain. Depending on your personal tax situation, how much you pay in taxes could vary, but let's say it's going to be 20% or $20,000. You could pay your $20,000 in taxes, or what you could do is 1031 that money into a small commercial property that would cost $500,000. You would have to put 20% down on a commercial property. It works out perfect because you have $110,000 in your 1031 exchange, so you can use that to buy a new property tax-free. You now buy that commercial property, use it for cash flow and depreciation, fix it up and raise the income to get the NOI up. Now let's say you sell it after two years and it's worth $800,000. Your original loan from the bank was $400,000, so by now you've paid it down to $380,000 because it went down from your monthly payments. So from this sale, you walk away with $800,000 minus $380,000 equals $420,000. This is how much you're going to walk away with from this property sale. Now you could take this money and run, but you're going to have a huge tax bill. Again, you have a gain on the property of $800,000 minus $500,000. You have a $300,000 tax bill here. In addition to this, you've also depreciated the property, so your taxable base is going to be well under $300,000 now. This would result in you paying over $60,000 in taxes at a 20% rate. Some people would look at it and realize they just turned $5,000 into over $200,000 after taxes, and they'd be very happy with that. But when those people realize that $420,000 in tax-free 1031 money, they can buy a property for over $2 million. The cash flow from that $2 million property would be over $50,000 a year if you bought a property right. If you wanted to continue this playbook over, you could have a million dollars of 1031 in the next step up the ladder. At this point, you can buy properties close to $5 million and the cash flow would exceed $100,000 a year. Or you could keep this $2 million property and enjoy the cash flow from its inflation happening and your debt being paid down by your tenants. Not bad considering you started with only $5,000 at the beginning of this story. The 1031 exchange is extremely powerful when utilized correctly. There are some drawbacks that you should be aware of. The first drawback is that when you sell your property, you have 45 days to identify a replacement property and 180 days to actually buy that property you say you're going to. This is okay if you already know which property you're going to buy, but it can lead you to making poor decisions because you're trying to avoid paying taxes. It also puts you in a very weak negotiating position if the seller of a property you're trying to buy knows you're in a 1031 exchange because that tells them you're working on a limited timeline. The next drawback is that you can only identify three potential properties you want to buy. If you identify more, you have to buy them all or pay your taxes. Purchase prices of the property have to be more than the sales price of the property you sold. You always have to buy bigger and bigger properties. Chapter 39, Refi Till You Die. While 1031 exchanges sound like and are powerful builders of wealth, there's another tool in the investor toolbox that's just as powerful and you've already heard about it. You see, the banks are willing to give us a percentage of what the property is worth in the form of a loan when we buy the property. In commercial, the maximum you're generally going to see is 80% of the purchase price funded by a bank in the form of a loan. This is what the money will look like when you first buy a property. In the book, if you want to check it out on page 111, I have a visual representation of what a property would look like at 80% levered. The total height of this represents the entire value of the property. The shaded part of the bar is the debt or what the bank is going to give us to buy the property. The clear part at the top of the bar is the money that we had to put in, and it's also called equity. The $200,000 is called equity, and the $800,000 is called debt. This would be on a million-dollar purchase at 80% levered. You currently have $200,000 in equity in the property. A formula you should know because it's fundamental in real estate, business, and personal wealth is this. Assets equals debts plus equity. In the above chart, we have as much debt on the property as a bank will give us. We are fully leveraged on this particular property. Now, let's say you've owned this property for five years and your property value has increased to $1.2 million due to inflation. Your debt is now down to $700,000 because you've been paying it off. Let's plug in our numbers to the above equation. The property is the asset. which you owe to the bank is called your debt. So your assets are $1.2 million. Your debts are $700,000. And now we want to solve for our equity. So our assets minus our debts, which is $1.2 million minus 700000 equals our equity. So what is our equity going to be? That's right. Our equity is now $500,000. Yes, that's right. You now have $500,000. Notice what happened here. 
you started off with $200,000 in equity in the beginning. Because the loan got paid down, you made $100,000 in equity. You made another $200,000 in equity because the property value went from $1 million to $1.2 million. In total, you turned $200,000 into half a million dollars. Because banks are in the business of lending money, they'll also give us a loan on properties we own that have extra equity in them. Yes, that's right. A bank will give you a loan on a property you already own. You don't have to sell a property in order to get the extra equity out of them. So in the above situation, we have a property that's worth $1.2 million. The bank is still willing to give us 80% of whatever the property is worth. So 80% times $1.2 million equals $960,000. If we take the bank up on this, we have to pay off our current loan. The current loan on the bank is $700,000. To calculate what we would end up with, we subtract the old loan from the new loan. So the new loan is going to be for $960,000. Our current loan is $700,000. So $960,000 minus $700,000 equals the money that comes to us from this refinance is $260,000. At the end of this exercise, we're going to have $260,000 left over that's going to come to us. But what's the best part about this $260K? It's all tax-free. No taxes are paid on this money. Wait a second, you're thinking, it's tax-free. Does that mean we're limited in what we can spend it on? Can I only use this to buy other real estate like 1031 exchange? Nope. You can spend this money on whatever you want. Take a vacation, go on a shopping spree, buy yourself a Lamborghini if you want. This money is yours and you can do whatever you want with it. This process is called a refinance or a refi for slang. Specifically, what we're doing is a cash out refi because you're getting your cash out of the property. Now, if you're a savvy investor, you'll realize using this money to buy more cash flow real estate is a smart play, but I'm not going to tell you how to live your life. The money comes out tax-free because it's technically debt. The money will have to be repaid to the bank at some point, but you already know and understand this. You aren't paying for this debt. Your tenants are. As a general rule, when you refi, your loan payments will go up. Let's look at the property before the refi. So before the refi, we had income of 100000 expense of 40000 and NOI of 60000 Our debt service payments were 15000 so 60000 NOI minus our debt service of 15000 gives us a $45,000 cash flow. Now after our refi, let's see what happens. Our NOI is the exact same at 60000 but our debt service went up to 25000 So 60000 minus 25000 now gives us a $35,000 cash flow. Your NOI is still 60000 but your debt payments have gone from 15000 to 25000 and this is going to drop your cash flow from 45000 to 35000 By taking a cash out refi, you're exchanging money now for money later. You're taking a lump sum now and increasing your payments in the future. Your monthly cash flow is going to go down because your loan amount with the bank increased, therefore increasing your monthly payments. When the loan amount goes up, your debt service goes up. A great way to think about this money is an advance from your property. How long would it take your property to pay you the refi proceeds? In the equation above, as we increased our annual debt payments by 10000 and we got to take out 290000 in cash. So it would have taken us 290000 divided by 10000 It would have taken us 29 years to save this much cash in the form of cash flow from this property. We essentially gave ourselves a financial shortcut of 29 years. It's pretty awesome. I love little financial hacks like this, especially when they're tax-free. Again, call your CPA and confirm this information for yourself if it sounds too good to be true. And please note, all these numbers are just an example and they're not real-world numbers. We're going to get into real-world numbers in the next section on debt. Chapter 40, Interest Write-Off. To come back around to the point that the government and the IRS wants us to borrow money, they've written in the tax code that you get to take interest on a loan as an expense for operating your piece of real estate. We'll dive into how it's determined how much of a loan payment is interest and how much is going to be repaid to actual debt in the next chapter. But for now, let's use a ballpark figure. On the above amount of $25,000 of debt to the bank each year, you're going to have $20,000 of interest payments. The taxable amount, if you did not use debt, would look like this. NOI of $60,000, let's say we took the $400,000 of depreciation, that would give us 60000 minus 400000 a taxable amount of negative 360000 Now let's look at our taxable amount if we did use debt. Again, our NOI is 60000 Our depreciation is 400000 which is going to give us a taxable amount of negative 360000 But we're also going to get to take off $20,000 of interest payments. And that's actually going to drop our taxable amount from negative $360,000 to negative $380,000. 
So by using debt to own this property, we get an extra tax benefit of being able to write off the interest we pay as an expense to the property. This is another benefit of using debt over not using debt to purchase a property. The government is rewarding you for borrowing money. I want to do a quick ROI check in with you guys. Are y'all getting value out of this book? Is this audio book helping you out? Has this book changed your financial life or at least given you the information you can use to change your life? If the answer is yes, I want to ask you to please do me a favor and text someone you care about this link. HaydenCrabtree.com forward slash free book. I want to get this information into the hands of as many people as I possibly can because all this information, it's free to know, but hardly anybody knows it. When you think about depreciation, you think about driving a car off the lot and you should you know, always buy a used car rather than a new car. Those are not the kind of tax benefits or depreciation people need to know about. People need to know about these types of benefits that can seriously impact their life. So text them HaydenCrabtree.com forward slash free book. I'll send them the same book for free. It'll change their life. It'll change your life. If you send it to somebody who has a growth mindset like you, you and that person are going to be able to talk about this. You're going to be able to hold each other accountable and make real world progress. So please text that link to someone you care about. Section eight, debt. Reading through and understanding this section in full will put you so far ahead of the rest of the world in terms of financial education. We're going to talk about how a payment is determined, interest rates, types of debt, the landmines of debt, and where most people go wrong. As we've already talked about, a bank will lend you money to buy a property. In return, you'll pay the bank a set amount over a certain number of years as repayment for that money. But banks don't do this for free. They want some interest on their money, and that's how a bank makes a profit. Let's go through some definitions. First is balance. This is how much you owe the bank if you were to pay it off now. The second is the payment, also called a mortgage payment or debt service. This is the amount you pay to the bank each month. The next is principal. This is money that goes towards paying off the loan in each payment. Then we have interest. This is the money that the bank keeps as a profit in each payment. Next we have amortization. This is how long it takes you to pay off the loan. Then we have points. This is the upfront fee for a loan. The next is a balloon. This is when the loan is actually due. And then we have LTV, or also known as loan to value. Simply saying this is what percentage of the property's value will the bank give us in a loan. Chapter 41, How a Loan Works. The biggest misconception that most people have when it comes to debt is thinking that debt is paid off in a straight line. They think that every payment has the same amount goes towards paying off the loan as it does going towards interest. They think that if they owe the bank $100,000 and make a $1,000 payment each month, they're paying $500 of interest and $500 in principal. From there, they think that after one month, the amount they owe the bank will be $99,500. Again, most people think that a loan goes down in a straight line. And this is not the case. The truth is that there are no two payments are exactly the same. You see, we're going to pay the bank a different split each time we make a payment. The bank is going to make sure that they get their interest before you actually start paying down the loan. So in the beginning, you're going to pay a huge amount of interest and a small amount of principal. On a $1,000 payment, $900 of it may be interest and only $100 may be principal. This means that if you had a balance of $100,000, after your first payment of $1,000, you're still going to have a balance of $99,900, even though you made a $1,000 payment. Every month, you're going to start paying more and more towards the principal. Because you now owe less than $100,000 to the bank, you're going to pay less in interest. The next payment may look something like this. It's still a $1,000 payment, but now instead of paying $900 of interest, you're going to pay $899 of interest and $101 towards principal. Now your balance goes from $99,900 to $99,799. The amount you owe the bank over time is going to go down steeper and steeper. If you're listening to this audio book, I want to ask that you go look at the physical book on page 124. It's very important that you understand that you pay more and more principal in each payment as time goes on. The total payment is equal to your interest payment plus your principal payment. As the interest payment goes down, the principal payment goes up, but the total payment stays the same throughout the entire life of your loan. On page 125, we have a chart of what the first 12 payments would look like, and it shows how over time you pay less and less in interest and more and more in principal, even though your payment amount stays the same. Go look at the chart on page 125. At payment zero, we've made no payment yet, so we still owe the bank $100,000. Now look down in the balance column for the amount we'll owe the bank. While our payment amount stays the exact same, we're paying a different amount of interest in principal with each payment. To get the balance after a payment, you'll subtract the payment's principal split from the previous balance. In the first couple of payments, we're paying a huge amount of interest. 
a large majority of that money is not going towards reducing our balance. Another way to put this is we're not reducing the amount of money we owe the bank by very much. Instead, a lot of our payment is going to be profit for the bank. With each month, more and more of our payment is actually going towards paying down the loan. Most people don't understand this. Please study the chart on page 125 and make sure you get this concept deeply embedded in your brain. This trend will continue all the way until the loan's paid off. Your first payment will be $1,000 with $900 going towards interest and $100 going towards principal. Your last payment will also be $1,000, but only $5 of that will go toward interest and $995 of that will go towards principal. The interest that you pay each month is going to be based off of how much principal you have and still owe the bank. It looks something like this. The amount of interest you pay is equivalent to your interest rate divided by 12 times the balance of your loan. In simple terms, if you had a 12% interest rate, you would be paying 1% a month. So 12% interest rate divided by 12 months would be 1%. If you owe the bank $100,000, you take that 1% and multiply it by $100,000. And in that month, you would be paying $1,000 of interest. Anything left over this $1,000 of interest you pay goes towards paying the balance reduction. As the balance reduces each month, so does your interest and the amount you're paying towards principal goes up. Over the life of the loan, the payoff would look like the following chart on page 126. Notice how it's not a straight line. Look how much principal is paid down between year zero and year five. Then you want to go and compare that with how much principal is paid down between year 15 and year 20. It's the same amount of time. Both time frames are five years, but the amount you pay down is much, much more. In the real world, numbers don't round out evenly like I'm talking about here, and they don't go down in a straight line. To go further in depth in a free video and grab a spreadsheet that will show you how debt is actually paid down with real numbers, go to haydencrabtree.com forward slash resources. I have a video there. It will explain to you guys how a loan actually amortizes, how you can figure out out of each of your payments, how much goes towards principal, how much goes towards interest, and you can figure out from there how much interest expense you're having and can write off on your taxes. Chapter 42, Interest Rates. Interest rates are the amount a bank wants to make on their money every year. So if a bank lends you $100,000 and you have a 5% interest rate, they want to make $5,000 of interest. If you have a 6% interest rate, you're going to pay them $6,000 a year. This is the price of money. The bank will determine what interest rate is appropriate according to what the interest rates are in the market, how risky your project is, and how credit worthy you are. The interest rates in the market are set by the Federal Reserve or by the price of government bonds, depending on what your lender likes to use. There are several different indexes your lender may use. Be sure to ask your lender which index they tie their rates to. If your project is mining for gold in China, that'd be considered a risky venture and will require a higher interest rate. If your project was buying well-performing apartments in the fastest growing city in America, you could get a low interest rate. Interest rates will also be impacted by how long you choose to pay off your loan. If you choose for it to take a long time to pay off your loan, the bank is going to want a higher interest rate. If you choose to do it in a shorter amount of time, they're likely to get a lower interest rate. The amount of time you wait to pay off your loan is called amortization. Chapter 43, Amortization. This is how long it takes you to pay off a loan. We'll see amortization rates in terms of years. It can range anywhere from 10 years to 35 years, depending on the project. Now, if you borrow the same amount of money, say $100,000, you could have wildly different monthly payments depending on your amortization rate. If a loan needs to be paid off in 10 years, your payment is going to be much higher than if it needs to be paid off in 35 years. The 10-year amortization payment at 5% will be $1,060 a month. At 35 years to amortize, at the same 5% interest rate, your monthly payment would only be $504. Even though you borrowed the same amount of money and your interest rate was the same, your payment is cut in half. The duration in which you amortize debt will directly impact your cash flow. So let's look at two examples. Let's say that we had the same property that had income of $2,000 a month, expense of $500 a month, and an NOI of $1,500 a month. If you chose a 10-year amortization, your NOI of $1,500 a month minus your debt payment of $1,060 a month would give you a cash flow of $440 a month. But on the same property, if you chose a 35-year amortization, your NOI would still be $1,500 a month, but now your debt payment is only $504 a month instead of $1,060, which means your cash flow goes from $440 a month up to $996 a month. It's the same exact property. You borrowed the same exact amount of money at the same exact interest rate, but because your amortization schedule is different, your cash flow is more than doubled. The same exact property can produce different cash flows depending on what kind of debt you use to buy it. This is a major key to understand. Different amortizations will often come at different rates, so it's extremely important to fully understand how debt works before you actually borrow any money. So what amortization rate should you aim for? 
Should you pay off your debt sooner and have less cash flow or pay it off longer and have more cash flow? This is an advanced conversation, so I made a video to explain it. Watch the video I made explaining this decision at HaydenCrabtree.com slash resources. Chapter 44, Balloons. No, we're not talking about a balloon like a birthday party, but for a visual representation, let's use one. Let's say you have a balloon that's blown up to 100% capacity. Your goal is to get the balloon completely emptied of all the air. You begin doing this very slowly by letting out air. At the end of one minute, you have let out 3% of the air. Now your balloon is at 97% capacity. You do it for another minute and you let out 5% more air. Now you're at 92% capacity. You continue to do this at an accelerated rate, meaning you let out more and more air every single minute. By the end of 10 minutes, you're at 0%. This is how a 10-year amortizing loan works. Every minute is equal to a year, and the amount of air you let out is the amount you're paying towards the balance. Each minute, you let out more air than you did the minute before, until the balloon is empty. When you reach 0%, you have no more debt. Now we introduce our little sibling who's impatient. Let's call him Johnny. Johnny is watching you do this, but after three minutes, he grows impatient, grabs a needle, and pops your balloon, letting all the air out at once. Johnny is the bank. The bank doesn't want to wait the full amortization period to get their money back. While we could wait the full 10 minutes to let the air out and get to 0%, the bank thinks they should do it quicker and let all the air out when the balloons still have 70% capacity left. When we first take out a loan, the bank is going to tell us what amortization the loan is going to be paid off and when the money is actually going to be due. I know it doesn't make much sense, but the bank does this because they face a risk called interest rate risk. If a bank makes a loan at $100,000 at 5% interest, and then in five years, interest rates have risen to 9%, the bank is shooting themselves in the foot because you have their money and you have it locked in at 5% interest, even though if you were to go out and get a new loan, you'd have to pay 9% interest. For us as borrowers, locking in an interest rate is good because we know what we're going to pay. For banks, this is bad because they lose the opportunity to charge more in interest. To combat this risk, banks implement these balloons where they tell you that all the money is currently due. Now, do you actually have to come up with all the money when the balloon's due to repay the bank? Well, for the most part, this is just a procedure the bank implements to reset your interest rates to whatever they are at the time. Most of the time, the bank will issue you a new loan for the same exact amount you owe them, so you're not going to have to pay them anything. Well, this is where things got dicey in 2008. Investors had debt balloons that were coming due in 2009. Well, in 2009, no banks were lending money, even on properties that were doing well. That's because the banks didn't have any money to lend. The majority of these projects were development projects where people were going out and getting loans that had balloons 12 to 24 months after the loan started. A major key to any real estate investment is that you go get long-term debt. Again, I repeat, a major key to any real estate investment is that you go out and get long-term debt. This means taking balloon payments that are very far away. Many bankers will ask for three-year balloons. A banker wants a short balloon because it reduces their interest rate risk and they get paid a fee each time we get a new loan, even when we're renewing a balloon. As investors, we want balloons that are very far away. And it is possible to negotiate with banks and always negotiate the balloon payment as far away from today as possible. It may cost you a little bit of a higher interest rate, but having a balloon further away is a great way to reduce your future risk. By making your balloon payment very far in the future, you allow yourself options if a crash were to happen. If a crash happens, you'll be fine as long as your tenants keep paying rent and your debt's not due. If your tenants keep paying rent, they'll cover your expenses, pay your mortgage, and put cash flow in your pocket. Please realize that you could do nothing wrong and your property could be performing well, but if you have a balloon due and you can't pay the bank because they aren't lending, you may have to sell the property well below what it's worth or give the property back to the bank. This is why it's important to buy stable cash flow properties and get long-term debt. You can tell your banker that you're willing to pay a little higher interest rate now in order for your balloon period to be pushed back further in the future. Your payments may be slightly higher, but you're going to reduce your risk, which is what investing is all about. They are less common, but loans do exist where there is no balloon due ever. Your loan will never be due, and your only obligation is to pay the mortgage each month for the full amortization period. This is called a fully amortizing loan. Chapter 45, Types of Loans. There are a few types of loans you should know about. The first is a traditional loan like we've just explained. This is the most common, and it's what you'll deal with the majority of the time. The next loan type is called interest only. Exactly like it sounds, on this loan, you only pay interest. If we had a 5% interest rate and borrowed $100,000, then our payments would be exactly $5,000 a year or $416 a month. When this loan comes due, we would have to pay back exactly the same amount we originally borrowed, which is $100,000. So if we borrowed $100,000 as above for five years, we would make payments of $416 every month. Then in 60 months, we'd have to pay back the full $100,000. These loans are less common and are harder to find. The benefit is that you boost your cash flow because you're not paying the principal down. 
The downfall is that you're not benefiting from any equity building up over time as a result of the loan being paid down. The next loan type is called variable rate. As it sounds, this is where your interest rate will change as interest rates change in the market. Your rate will be tied to some sort of index and will change at some preset time period, like every quarter. If your rate was tied to the Fed fund rate, which is set at Fed fund rate plus 2%, your interest rate would track that rate, which is set by the Fed, plus 2%. So if the Fed fund rate went down, your interest rate would go down without having to get a new loan. You would also have to pay a higher interest rate if the rates in the market went up. So this type of loan provides uncertainty as what your payment will be in the future. Now that you understand more about how debt works, you can understand where some of the risks in real estate investing lie. You see, in real estate, success is a combination of the cash flows from the property, the value of the property, as well as how you finance the property. There's a three-legged stool. You can't have success without all three legs. If you know how to make the value go up but don't know how to finance it properly, you'll be less effective. Chapter 46, Points. Points are what you pay to the bank as an upfront fee. If you borrow $100,000 and the fee is one point, then you're going to have to pay the bank $1,000 up front to get this loan. If you have to pay them a point and a half, that's a $1,500 fee. Two points would be $2,000. You get how this works. It's pretty simple. These are also called origination fees or bank fees. It's just another way for the bank to make money off you and many times can be used as a bonus or a commission for the person handling your loan at the bank. These are negotiable, but think about what I said earlier about a realtor. If you try to squeeze them out of the commission, how hard are they going to fight for you and try to get you the best deal possible? If you squeeze the banker on the commission, will they want to pick the call up next time you try and get a loan for a property? Listen, if everybody wins, then everybody wins. So don't try and cut someone on their payday if they're helping you make money. Chapter 47, Loan to Value, also known as LTV. Debt, which is also called leverage, can explode your property's financial returns for you as an investor. LTV is important to understand because it helps us buy, refinance, and optimize our real estate investments. LTV, or Loan to Value, is simply known as the loan amount divided by the property value. The general rule for a commercial investment is that you're going to be able to get up to 80% LTV. This means that if we're buying a property for a million dollars, the bank is going to give us 80% of that. 80% of a million dollars is 800000 If we're buying a property for $2 million, they'll give us $1.6 million, which is 80% of $2 million. We'll have to come up with the rest of the money to buy the property. And again, this is called equity, the money we have to come up. The bank has lines drawn in the sand when it comes to LTV. Why is that? The banks are in the money business. They like to lend money. They don't like to manage and own real estate. To protect themselves from ever having to own and operate real estate, they build a buffer into the property to make sure that if they ever had to sell the property, they could get all their money back. So if you were to go out and buy a property for a million dollars with an 80% LTV loan and you failed, and the bank has to foreclose on the property, they'd want to turn around and get rid of this property as quickly as they could. They don't want to manage it. So they're not concerned with getting the maximum amount of money out of this property. Instead, they just want to get their money back. So they'll sell this property to the first person that comes along and offers them $800,000 for it, which to many investors will do that because the property is worth a million dollars, but you failed on it. The bank only wants to get $800,000 back so they can turn around and lend that $800,000 again. The banks like to build these buffers in so they can recoup their money in the worst case scenarios. The banks also like for us to have skin in the game so that we're really paying attention to the property performing well. The banks want us to know that if the investment goes bad, we're losing our money as investors before the banks lose any money. So if this property failed and we sold it for $900,000 to avoid being foreclosed on, even though the bank put up 80% and we put up 20%, we would lose $100,000 and the bank would get repaid in full. We would still walk away with the money left over, but the bank would get their full money and we would lose money. Banks have first rights to all monies that come out of the property, but they don't get their share of the upside profits when a project goes well. Well, there you have it. That's the overview of how debt works and how it can benefit a real estate investor. Listen and listen and listen to this section as many times as possible. I'd really suggest you get the book and read it as well. Learn all you can about debt and how it works. As mentioned in the beginning of this book, debt is a tool just like a chainsaw. When you know how to handle a chainsaw, you can be very effective at cutting down trees. But when you don't handle a chainsaw with care, things can get ugly. Section 9, Underwriting and Investment. Chapter 48, Analyze the Property. This is a crucial chapter to understand before you get into your first investment. To underwrite means to analyze. It's a fancy financial word for taking a look at the numbers a little bit closer. When we underwrite a property, we're going to create a pro forma. The purpose of a pro forma is to analyze our income, expenses, NOI, debt service, cash flows, and overall performance of an investment over a period of time. By looking at a pro forma, we should be able to predict with accuracy what our cash flow from a property will be and what the value of a property will be in the future and what kind of money we can expect to make. 
In the previous chapters, I've shown you a very basic formula. It goes like this. Income minus expenses equals NOI. NOI minus debt service equals cash flow. This is a great way to quickly analyze a property, but the truth is this is too simplistic. The format only looks over one period of time for a single year and only looks at the income statement. In real estate, we have two statements that we need to be aware of. The first is the income statement, which we just looked at, and the next is the balance sheet. These two statements are equally important for real estate as they are for your personal financial life in any business. The income statement, referred to as the profit and loss or P&L, is where we're going to show our income and our expenses. This is where we'll find our NOI as well as our cash flows on the P&L. The balance sheet is where we're going to view how much our property is worth as well as how much debt we have on that property. From those two numbers, we're going to be able to figure out how much equity we have in the property. Also on a property balance sheet, we'll see how much cash it has in its bank account and ready to pay for unexpected expenses, or if it has any reserves built up, ready to pay for any repairs if they're needed. While the pro forma will include elements about the profit and loss in the balance sheet, it will not use the full reports for these two financial statements. The full picture for a pro forma should have more to it than we've looked at before. A pro forma should actually look like this. And guys, if you want to go check this out in the physical book, page 142. The income statement will have your income minus your expenses equals your NOI minus your debt service equals your cash flow. The balance sheet will have the property value minus the debt balance equals our equity. You see how we've added the equity and the property to what we're looking at and when we analyze it in our pro forma? This will give us a more holistic view of how our investment is performing. It will also let us know how much money we've made behind the scenes that's not yet been deposited into our bank account. These are profits that require a little work to access. We either have to sell the property or refi the property in order to access these profits and turn them into cash in our bank. But still, in this we're only looking at a single time period. And we know that we're going to hold an investment property for much more than just one year. We could hold the property for the rest of our lives. The standard period to look at a property is for five years, so it's going to look like this. Guys, go look on page 143 of the physical book. There's a five-year graph of a full pro forma. This is what a template looks like. Let's run through an example. We buy a property that has $100,000 annual income, and it has $40,000 of annual expenses. Now here's a warning, we're about to do a lot of math. It's very easy math, but it's very easy to also get lost in all this if you're not following along in paper. So we're starting on page 143 here, and I'd really highly suggest you guys go watch through it. I also have a video you can watch through underwriting this whole thing, haydencrabtree.com forward slash resources. Go watch the video or follow along in the book. I'm gonna do my best to try and uh, display this information to you guys through this audio book. If you'd like to read through or listen through, let's keep going. I'd recommend reading through first and also watching the video after you're done with this. So in the first year, we have our income of 100000 We have our expenses of 40000 What's our NOI going to be? That's right. Our NOI is going to be 60000 100000 minus 40000 Now that we have the NOI, we know what the value is going to be. Let's say we bought the property on a six cap. So using the NOI, how much did we pay for the property? So $60,000 on a 6% cap rate is a $1 million. So you see how we're combining the cash flow elements of the property into the addition of the valuation of the property? This is what a pro forma is all about, looking at both cash flow and value at the same time. Really what we want to look at is equity, because as investors, the equity we have in the property is more important than the value of the property itself. Now let's say we have 80% LTV on this million dollar purchase. What's our debt balance going to be when we first buy it? So 80% of a million dollars is 800000 so we borrowed 800 k from the bank, and we had to put in the rest. How much equity did we have to put in the property to start with? As a hint, it's $1 million minus $800,000. That's right. The equity we had to put in was 20% of the million, or $200,000. Is this making sense so far? All right. So now what we want to do is figure out what the cash flow is going to be. So we have to calculate our debt. Let's say we got a 30-year amortizing loan at a 5% interest rate. I'll do the math for you. The payment's going to be $52,041 a year. I calculated this using the information of the debt section of this book. If you like to use Excel or Google Sheets, you can enter the following formulas. Equals PMT, open parentheses, 0 0.05, comma, 30, comma, negative 800,000. Okay? And if you do that in a Google Sheet or Excel, it'll give you how much we should be paying each year in debt payments. Okay, so we know our NOI is $60,000. Our debt payments are $52,041 a year. So now we want to figure out what our cash flow is. So we subtract our debt payments from our NOI, and that gives us $7,958 of cash flow a year. Awesome. We've just completed our first year of a pro forma. 
We should be able to get the numbers for year one of the investment very easily. Now that we have year one, we need to move on looking at year two and what we can expect out of the property in year two. This is going to require a little more thought than year one is going to require. Let's say this investment is a 10-unit apartment complex and it has no room for improvements and the rent on the units is at $833 a month. We're buying this property and we're going to ride the inflation wave. That's all we're going to do. Let's see what this pro forma looks like for year two. First, our income is going to increase by the amount of inflation, 2%. This will take our income from $100,000 a year to $102,000 a year. So what I'm going to do on the income line in year two is I'm going to put in $102,000. At the same time, our expenses are going to increase by 2% as well. All I did here was $40,000 times 1.02, and I put that in year two of the pro forma. So now that we have our income and our expenses for year two, let's figure out what our year two NOI is. Let's figure out what our year two NOI is. So 102,000 minus 40,800 equals 61,200. Now look at that. Even though the income and expenses both increased by 2%, we had good NOI growth. This is a powerful concept to understand. Even though income and expenses grew at the same rate because income was a larger number than expenses, it grew by a bigger dollar amount and the result is you're going to have a bigger NOI. Now let's skip down to the property value for the second year before we plug in our cash flow. Let's take our new year two NOI and see what happened to our property value on the 6% cap rate. So we're going to divide the year two NOI, which is 61200 by a 6% cap. So from year one, our property value was a million dollars. In year two, because our NOI rose, our new property value is $1,020,000. Just like that, only because inflation occurred, our property appreciated by $20,000. Do you see how in this pro forma you have a full picture of both cash flow and value and how the two are interconnected? They aren't separate. A cash flow and an NOI of a property is directly correlated to the property's value and you want to have that all in one picture and that's what a pro forma does for us. Now let's jump back to the debt and the cash flow. Our debt payment is not going to change. It's going to stay the same at $52,041. So what will our cash flow in year two be? So we're going to take $61,200 minus the $52,000 of debt service. That's going to give us a year two cash flow of 9,158. This is a 15% increase from year one, even though we only had a 2% increase in inflation. But is this the only way we've made money? No, we also benefited from our debt being paid down. As we now know, the first year is going to be the smallest pay down of any year because we know how a loan works. I'll do the math for us based off the spreadsheet I referred to earlier. So even though it's our lowest year ever, we still benefited from a $12,041 reduction in the balance of our loan. So what's the equity of our new property at the end of year two? Well, all we have to do is take the property value and subtract out the debt balance. So we take our new property value of $1,020,000, we subtract out our debt balance of $787,000, and our new property equity equals $232,000. Are you following this? From year one to year two, we made over $32,000 in equity from appreciation because inflation occurred and from debt pay down. In addition, in year two, we put almost $10,000 in our pocket through cash flow. This is the basis of a pro forma. Now what we want to do is play the same thing out over a five-year period. See below on page 150 for a five-year full picture. All we did here was multiply the expenses and income by 1.02 each year and reduce the debt pay down by the Excel graph that showed us how to do it. If you need that Excel doc, go pick it up, haydencrabtree.com forward slash resources. At the start of this investment, our income was $100,000, our NOI was $60,000, and our cash flow was just under $8,000. Our property value was a million flat, and our equity was $200,000. At the end of year five, all those numbers have increased. Our annual cash flow is close to $13,000. Our property value is over $1,080,000, and our equity has gone from $200,000 to $334,000. If we would have sold this property in year five, we would have gotten a total of $52,000 of cash flow and made another $134,000 in a rise in equity. This is why they say, don't wait to buy real estate, buy real estate and wait. Looking at this five-year picture is called underwriting, and this specific analysis is a pro forma. Chapter 49, Value Add Investing. Now that we have this knowledge about how to underwrite, we can analyze different options. For example, we can analyze how this investment would look if the current rents on these units are 833, but they should really be at $1,000 for each unit a month. How would we analyze that investment? Well, first we'd realize that the only factor we need to change from the previous pro forma is the income line. We're going to have 10 units at $1,000 each a month for 12 months. Our new income will be 10 units times $1,000 times 12 months, and this comes out to $120,000 a year. We also need to realize that this will take us some time to raise the rents, so let's say the income doesn't change until year two. 
So our year one is going to look exactly the same. We're going to finance the property the same way. Our income, expenses, debt, cash flow, and value are all going to be the same. Now we raise the income to $120,000 in year two. The income goes up, but the expenses will still only rise by the rate of inflation. Now we can look at our new NOI after the raise. So we have $120,000 in income minus our same year two expenses of $40,800, and our new NOI is $79,200. Now that we have our new NOI, let's look at what happened to our cash flow. So the new NOI is $79,200 minus debt service of $52,041. Our new cash flow in year two is $27,158. All of the additional monies that came from the rate raise go straight to the NOI, but it's not going to affect our debt payments, so it also gets directly passed on to our cash flow. This is money that we're going to get to keep. Because the NOI went up, guess what? So did our value. We're still going to use the same percent six cap as our NOI changed, but our cap rate is going to stay the same. So to get our new value of our property, we need to do 79200 which is our year two NOI, divided by a 6% cap rate. If we do 79200 divided by 0 0.06 in your calculator, that's going to give us a value of $1.32 million, $1,320,000. Our new value after the rate raise is $1.32 million. After our debt pay down, it's going to translate into over a half a million dollars in equity in year two. This is the kind of investing that I love to do, and this kind of investing is called value-add investing. The whole reason we underwrite and use a pro forma to analyze these investments is to understand what the property could be once we add value to it. Value-add investing allows you to operate the property better than the previous owner and therefore increase the value of the property due to a higher NOI. At year two, we've already added a lot of value to the property, but we'll still get the benefits of inflation and debt pay down going forward. Let's take a look at where we'll be after five years by continuing to multiply the income and expenses by 1.02 for inflation. In this example, which is very doable in the real world, we've taken $200,000 and turned it into more than $650,000 of equity. That doesn't include cash flow or tax benefits. One thing to note is the equity amount is not a benefit we get every year. If you're looking at the chart on page 154, you need to understand you're only going to get the equity amount if you sell the property. It'd be the same amount if we were to sell the property that year. Now, if we sold in year two, we could get out $532,000. If we sold in year five, we could get out $652,000. We don't get the $532,000 in year two and the $652,000 in year five. Does that make sense? To recap value add investing, we put down $200,000 on the property. We raised the rents from $833 a month to $1,000 a month. That made our income go from $100,000 a year to $120,000 a year. Because the extra income went up, our NOI went up. The NOI going up made our property value go up. The value of the property went from $1 million to $1.4 million in year five. Our NOI went up, but our debt payment stayed the same. Our cash flow went from $7,900 in year one to over $32,000 a year in year five, and we turned $200,000 into $652,000 of equity in just five years. This may seem challenging to do on your own, especially if you're listening to this, but I promise you it's all very simple math. Again, all you have to do to get these steps, HaydenCrabtree.com forward slash resources. I have a video walking you through this. I also have a spreadsheet you can download. Go get it. Section 10, Understanding Returns. Let's stop for a second and do a ROI check-in. ROI stands for return on investment. So while we're talking about returns, I want to ask you a question. Do you feel like the knowledge you've learned in this book is worth the price you paid? My goal here is to make sure you walk away from reading this book saying that you would have paid 100x what you actually did and it still would have been a good deal. I hope you've learned so much that your brain's about to explode, but in a good way. Let's keep on going. Speaking of ROIs, in this chapter, we're going to use the knowledge we just learned from the pro forma to understand some different return metrics so that you can compare one investment to another and use this as a guide to decide on where you should spend your time and money. Chapter 50, Make a Decision. Let's think for a minute what our life would look like if we didn't use financial returns to guide our decision-making process. Let's compare the opportunity in the last chapter where we took rents from $833 to $1,000 a month and compare it to the following opportunity. They both cost a million dollars and require 200000 in upfront equity. In the new deal, we're in a market where rents grow at 6% instead of 2%. We were also able to get lower interest rate from a bank, which resulted in our debt payments and our pay down on loan being different. Which opportunity would you choose? So if you're listening to this audiobook, go look on page 160 of the physical book and you can compare option one to option two. Option one was the one we just walked through where the rents raise. Option two is where the only thing that happens is that our rents grow by 6% a year and our debt payments are a little bit different. 
Making a decision can be hard if we don't use metrics to help us. In one scenario, the property is worth more at the end of five years. The second deal, though, has more cash flow in the beginning. Then the first deal takes over and has more cash flow between year two and year three. Then the second deal takes back over and has more cash flow in year four and five. Then the second deal takes over again, and in year four, it has more cash flow. There's no clear answer on which deal is better if you're just looking at the performance. Without having a method to decide which deal you should choose, you may end up making the wrong decision. Both deals seem to be great deals, but they make their money at different speeds. The first deal makes a majority of its money between year one and year two, while the second deal takes longer to make its money because it has a slower increase in income. Chapter 51, Time and Money. If you don't back your decision in math, then you could make mistakes. Mistakes that could end up costing you millions of dollars over your entire life. This is why, as investors, we have to know and live by our financial returns. There are a few return metrics you need to learn here, but first you need to understand a fundamental to wealth that few people understand. This fundamental is called the time value of money, or also TVM. What TVM tells us is that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. That's because if we have a dollar today, we can invest it and have it grow each and every single day. So again, a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. So if you have $100 and you can invest it at 10% a year, then in a year you would have $110. If you do that again for another year, you'll have $121, not $120. You see how the gain from year one to year two is $10 and the gain from year two to year three is $11? You're going to earn a return on the money that you got back from the initial investment, making your investment grow faster and faster. This is called compound interest. I think Einstein called this the eighth wonder of the world. Here's what $100 at 10% a year looks like on non-compound interest versus compound interest. On non-compound interest, after 10 years, $100 invested at 10% non-compounding would be worth $200. A 10% return on that same $100 that gets compounded at the end of 10 years is going to be worth $259. So again, compounding versus non-compounding is $200 versus $259. If you want to check out this chart, go to page 162 of the physical book. When you do not reinvest your earnings, you'll still have an investment amount of $100. When you do reinvest your earnings, the amount you're earning interest on will go up and up each year. This will make your investment grow by a larger amount each year. When we're talking about $100, it doesn't sound like a lot. The difference at the end of 10 years is only $200 versus $259. So what's the big deal? Well, what if we're investing $100,000 or $1 million? In the case of investing $1 million, now we're talking about the difference of over a half a million dollar difference, compounding versus non-compounding. You see, when most people think about a return, they think about how much did I invest and how much did I receive? If you made an investment of $10,000 and you received back $15,000, what was your return on that investment? Most people will tell you that you made a 50% return, and that makes sense, right? 15000 divided by 10000 equals 150%. That math seems to look good to me. Now, what if you invested $10,000 and didn't get that $15,000 back until five years later? Did you still earn a 50% return? The common answer would be yes, but in reality, your return per year was much lower. Oh, I get it, is what you're thinking. I made $5,000 over five years, so I really made $1,000 a year. $5,000 over five years, that's $1,000 a year. 1000 divided by 10000 is a 10% return. So what you're thinking is, my return on investment of this $15,000 for a 10000 investment over five years is really 10%, not 50 not 50%. While you're getting closer, we're still wrong. You didn't make 10% a year because your money's supposed to grow at a compounding rate like the chart showed us. Again, all this comes back around to why you need to understand what time value of money is. In reality, you're making less than 10% a year. To make 10% a year, you'd have to receive back $16,105 as a payment in year five. To get this calculation, all you need to do is this. 10,000 times 1.1 times 1.1 times 1.1. You get where I'm going with this. You need to do that five times to figure out how much you'd be owed at a compounding 10% rate over five years. And again, $10,000 growing at 10% for five years comes out to $16,105 a year. If you invested the $10,000 and got back $15,000 in year five, time value of money tells us the reality is you're only getting an 8.45% compounded return on your money. All of a sudden, your investment that was a 50% return is now less than 10% a year. Ouch. 
listen, my reason for telling you this is because you need to know and be educated on what's really happening with your money. You also need to understand the different investment opportunities are going to provide and the different financial benefits can come in different ways. Like our comparison between the two examples above, one may have more cash flow sooner with the other providing more equity. One may return $100 in year two and the other returns may double that amount but it takes six years. One could have greater tax benefits while the other has less tax benefits. The list goes on and on. You need a way to make decisions that are backed in logic, not just gut feelings. With all these numbers flying around, how do you know how to make a decision that will maximize your money? Chapter 52, Internal Rate of Return. For my finance nerds out there who know what IRR is, you can skip this chapter. If IRR looks like a foreign language to you, continue listening. You need to start using the internal rate of return, which is also known as the IRR metric, to measure your wealth and how fast your money's growing. IRR measures how much your money grows each year from where it was the year before. It looks at your money and says it should be compounding each year and will give you the percent number for which each deal grows. What's so great about the IRR is that it looks at a very complex equation and gives you a simple number to use as a judge. The IRR equation can account for different amounts of money coming at different times. In the chapter prior to this one, I said if you were to invest $10,000 and five years later you received $15,000 back, that would be an 8.45% return. That 8.45% is the IRR at which your money grew, the internal rate of return. I wish I could give you a simple formula for the IRR, but due to its complexity, I can't. The best way to calculate the IRR is either with a financial calculator or with an Excel or Google spreadsheet. While I wish we could go into more depth, I fear that I'll lose your attention and not be able to clearly communicate exactly how IRR works. For that reason, this chapter is going to take place online at the link below. I have a full video on this at HaydenCrabtree.com forward slash resources that will walk you through and show you the differences in the IRR between the two examples above and which one you should choose if you're investing your own money for maximum wealth growth. My hope is that this exercise opens your eyes to ways in which the 1% look at money that normal people don't. When you realize that your money should compound, you begin to look at your investments differently. Please go watch this video, HaydenCrabtree.com slash resources, because I'm going to show you exactly how to do this for yourself, and I feel that you'd be cheating your financial education if you didn't go watch it. My opinion is that IRR trumps all other metrics, but we're still going to explain a few other popular metrics that you can use and that are simple to calculate. Chapter 53, Cash on Cash. For the average real estate investor, cash on cash is the most popular metric. If the property costs $500 with an 80% LTV, we only have to put in $100 and the bank gives us $400. How much does the property pay us after we pay for our expenses and debt? If the property paid us $12 a year in cash flow, then we'd have a 12% cash on cash. That's because we're getting paid $12 a year and we only had to put in $100. 12 divided by 100 is 12%. If that same property only paid us $5 a year, then we'd have 5 divided by 100, which would be a 5% cash on cash. The cash on cash metric measures how much in annual cash flow you receive for every dollar in equity you had to spend up front. So cash on cash equals annual cash flow divided by equity required to buy your property. Again, cash on cash equals your annual cash flow divided by how much equity was required for you to put in to buy that property. The cash on cash measures don't care how much you bought the property for, it only cares about how much money you personally had to put in in equity up front. Because of the way we can buy properties using a bank's money, we may not get the full picture of how much annual cash flow we're going to get by looking at the NOI and cap rate. We have to analyze the numbers and look at how much we receive every year in cash flow and how much we had to put into the property. This is only measuring and comparing cash flow. No other benefits of the real estate investment are considered in the cash on cash measurement. We do expect the annual cash on cash number to change as our investment performs differently each year. On page 168, we have a pro forma from an earlier chapter that shows how the cash on cash changes each year. As you can see in this example, our cash on cash changes each year and more than doubles from year one to year five. In the beginning, we had a 7.8% cash on cash, and in year five, we had a 19.3% cash on cash. In year one, we had $15,667 of cash flow, and the equity required to buy that property was $200,000. If we take the $15,667 and divide it by the $200,000, we get 7.83. Now, in year five, we had $38,618 of cash flow. 
the equity required is still the same two hundred thousand dollars, but we had an increase in our cash flow. So we take the thirty eight thousand six hundred eighteen and divided by two hundred thousand to get nineteen point three one. The cash on cash metric is a good one to use if you're trying to compare financing alternatives and what's going to be best for you in your cash flow. For example, if one bank wanted to lend you a seventy percent LTV. 5% interest on a 20 year AM, and another bank wanted to lend to you at 80% LTV, 5.5% interest on a 25 year AM, you could use the cash on cash metric to compare which loan option you should take to maximize your cash flow. On page 169 of the physical book, I have a graph you can look at. As you can see in option one, we put $300,000 into the property. This is found beside the My Equity line. We then borrowed the other $700,000 from the bank. Because we borrowed $700,000, we have annual payments of $56,169. The NOI on the property is $75,000, so to get our cash flow, we're going to subtract the debt payments from our NOI. $75,000 minus $56,169 equals $18,830 of cash flow. Again, take a look at the physical book to keep up with all these numbers. Now we want to take our cash flow and see that as a percentage of the $300,000 we put in. So to do that, it's going to be 18830 which is our cash flow, divided by our 300000 which is our initial equity. Our cash on cash in this scenario is 6.28. Now let's compare that to the next option. Option two, which is what the other bank wanted to lend us, we have a longer amortization period, a higher interest rate, and also a higher LTV. Because we have a higher LTV, it means the money we have to put in is less. Now instead of putting 300000 into the property, we only had to put 200000 into the property. Because we borrowed more money, our debt payments are going to be higher. The property has the same NOI, so to calculate our cash on cash, we're going to have to do the same thing as we did before. $75,000 NOI minus $59,639 of debt service equals $15,360 of cash flow. To get our cash on cash, we take the $15,360 and divide it by how much we put into the property, which was $200,000. So $15,360 divided by $200,000 equals 7.68%. In the first option, we had $18,800 of cash flow. In the second option, we had $15,300. But because we put less money into the deal on option two, we have a higher cash on cash. Even though we made less cash flow in option two, we had a higher cash on cash because we had to put in less money. You're making more cash flow each year with option one, but you're making a lower cash on cash because you had to put down more money. With option two, you're making less cash flow, but that money costs you less in terms of how much you had to put down up front. So what the cash on cash tells us is how to optimize our cash flow for the money that we do have. If your goal is to build a lot of cash flow, then you should be aiming to choose deals and financing options that give you the highest cash on cash. Chapter 54, Adding Tax Benefits to Your Returns. It's not very common for real estate investors to add tax benefits into a pro forma or return metrics for a property. I've never fully understood why this is not a common practice. The main reason that I can think of is that tax benefits are going to vary from investor to investor, just like debt payments will based on their credit worthiness. The benefits that a high income earner is going to receive from $100,000 of depreciation is going to yield a different result than someone who's only making $50,000 a year, mainly because of tax brackets and different tax credits. It is worthwhile for an investor when underwriting a property to consult their accountant and talk about what kind of tax benefits they can expect for a certain type of property. From there, they can add those tax benefits into the pro forma and truly compare apples to apples. You could, for example, have a piece of land that's leased and you could be earning a 12% cash on cash for that investment. But let's say for the same equity investment, you could have bought an apartment complex. At first glance, the apartment complex may yield 10% cash on cash, but what if after depreciation, it allowed the investor to recoup 50% of their money through the first year of depreciation and shielding their taxes? While the land has a higher cash on cash and looks like a better investment at first, you may find out that because of the tax benefits the apartments offer that the land doesn't, you come off better at the end of the day. For that reason, I advocate adding an additional line at the bottom of your performa where you add back in how much you'll save in taxes. Don't underestimate how juicy tax benefits can be for your deals. Chapter 55, How Leverage Affects Your Returns. In this section, we focused on the return of your money rather than the return of the entire real estate project. If we could have used no debt to assist us in buying these projects, then the project returns would be equal to the return on our money. If we have a good project with a nice return and we have the full million dollars to spend on the project, some people would think to themselves they could skip using the bank's money because they'll get a higher return on the project without using debt. Listen, this mindset will slow down your wealth growth tremendously. Not only would this allow you to do less projects, it would also cause you to have lower overall returns. When we can use a bank's money to do more project and also earn a higher return, we call this positive leverage. For example, we might have a project that has a 12% return 
we have to pay the bank 6%. And because of this, the return on our money could be 18%. The project return again was only 12%, but because we had to pay the bank less than that, we're having a positive leverage on our equity. However, we do have to be aware that leverage can work in the opposite way too. If we have a project return that's only 4% and we have to pay the bank 6%, then the return on our money could be 2%. In this example, our debt is costing us more than our project earns us. This actually decreases the return on our property. When debt hurts us like this, it's also called negative leverage and it's not good. Stay away from negative leverage. To find out what the bank is going to get, we need to look at the cost of both the interest and the principal we're paying on an annual basis. This is called the mortgage constant, and simply put, it's your monthly payment times 12. Once you get your monthly payment times 12, that's your annual debt payment. You take that amount and divide it by the total loan amount outstanding. Let's say we borrowed $100,000 and our loan payment was $952 a month. What would our mortgage constant be? Well, to figure this out, we simply take the monthly payment of $952 times 12, that comes out to $11,424, and we divide that $11,424 by the $100,000 we borrowed. So $11,424 divided by $100,000 is a mortgage constant of 11.42%. Does that make sense? Once you get a mortgage constant, you can make yourself aware of whether getting debt is beneficial to you on this project or not. If you know that your mortgage constant is 11.42%, then you're looking for projects that are going to return more than that. Another way to quickly find out if your project makes sense and meets these criteria is to see if your cap rate is higher than the mortgage constant. Your cap rate is going to be equal to your cash on cash if you use no debt. As long as the mortgage constant is less than the cap rate, you'll have positive leverage. Fair warning about the mortgage constant as it has to be applied with some thought. If you have a value add project with a 2% cash on cash in year one and then a 15% cash on cash in year two, you could have negative leverage in year one and positive leverage in year two. This is where you have to be aware of how your project is going to work out. But if the project is never going to have positive leverage, then I would suggest you walk away from that property and find somewhere else to spend your time, energy, and money. Chapter 56, Conclusion on Returns. The most important takeaway from this section for you to realize is that you need to guide your investments backed in logic and math. While it's important you have a good feeling about a deal, you also need to make sure the numbers work. If you have a bad cash on cash or IRR, you need to spend your money and time on another project that will grow your wealth faster. Each return measurement has its advantages and disadvantages. Read this chapter again several times until you fully understand how returns work. Once you understand how returns work and what each of them means, your competence and confidence as a real estate investor will rise dramatically. Because you know what you're looking at and how to make the right decision with your time and money, your decision-making ability will go up. In my Real Estate Academy, there's a full workbook and video series that goes further into depth on how to calculate returns and the proper way to use them. We walk through real-world examples and you learn how I underwrite properties and analyze them. Also in the Academy, we cover many other real estate metrics such as gross rent multiplier and the equity multiple. The more you can learn about analyzing properties and financial returns, the higher your financial IQ will be. The higher your financial Q, the more money you'll make. There's also a spreadsheet program that automates much of the pro forma process and calculates the property returns for you to save you many, many hours. This deal analyzer tells you the IRR, cash on cash, and tells you how much you should actually be paying for a property based off of what kind of returns you want in what year. Having so much of this process automated for you will save you hundreds of hours, headaches, and will give you confidence in your numbers. This program is so powerful because it will also show you what happens to your returns under several scenarios, such as what happens if my rents increase by 3% instead of 2%, or what happens if I upgrade some of my rental units and can therefore charge higher rents. If you want to see this awesome spreadsheet in action, go to haydencrabtree.com forward slash resources, and you can pull up a video there to see all about how it works. Section 11, Putting It All Together. You've learned a tremendous amount so far. For sticking through this, I want to give you a reward. The reward you're about to get is my exact business model I'm using today and I intend to use forever. This is the overarching strategy that I use to guide my personal real estate investments. I call this the free real estate playbook. Sounds pretty awesome, right? Well, it is. In this section, you're going to learn a method you can use to get real estate for free. This method is going to help you scale your real estate business faster than you ever could have imagined. Let me show you how. Without having learned all the basics that you've learned up until this point, you wouldn't understand how this is possible. You would think this section is a trick. That being said, if you've skipped any of the prior chapters, please go back and read those so you can take full advantage of what we're about to show here. If you don't understand the fundamentals, you can't understand how they work together to make this possible. Get your notebook ready because this is life-changing. Now let's do this. Chapter 57, Free Real Estate. First, let's define our goal. You want to own cash flow real estate that will pay you each month for the rest of your life, and you want to do it with none of your own money. 
Sure, we could do it with our own money, but we'll eventually run out of our own money no matter how much of it we have. If we could use the bank's money to do it instead of our own, that'd be much better. The banks aren't going to run out of money anytime soon. Let's begin with our property. We're going to seek out a value-add property. Because we are all familiar with this, we'll go with an apartment complex. We seek out an apartment complex that is currently underperforming. It could be underperforming for many reasons, but we recognize that this property could have a much higher NOI than it currently does. The example we'll use, the property has a current NOI of $64,000 a year, and because it needs some love, we can buy it on an 8 cap for $800,000. That's represented by the following images. If you're listening to the audio, go look at page 182 of the physical book. As we know, we can go to the bank and ask them for an 80% LTV loan. They see the potential in this property, so they agree to give you the loan. They lend you 80% of $800,000, which comes out to $640,000. Now you have a great property ready to buy and ready to add some value. You have a bank ready to loan you 80% of the project at 5% interest on a 30-year AM schedule. You also remember to negotiate a long balloon period so you don't have to pay off your debts anytime soon. All you have to do is come up with the 20% or 160000 to put into this property. As represented in the image on page 182, the bank is going to give you 80% of the purchase in debt and you have to put in 20% in equity. If you have the 160000 that's awesome. You can use your own money and I'm going to show you how to get that money back so you have none of your own money in the deal. If you don't have the $160,000, then you can find some investors. I'm going to teach you how you can talk to investors, so keep reading and you'll learn as we go through this chapter. So, we're going to buy this property, whether it be with our investors' money or with our own. Once we purchase the property, we're going to begin working on it and increasing the NOI. When we're looking to buy the property, we make a pro forma. The pro forma looks like this. If you listen to the audio, go look at page 183 of the physical book. I'm going to show full pro forma and how these numbers work. Okay, so we knew that when we bought this property, we had $100,000 of income, and that was extremely low for this property. It has 20 units, and they're each renting for $500 a month. But because the property's not being managed well, there are several tenants not paying their rent and living there for free. While we're looking at the property, we want to find out how much it could make if all the units were rented and all the customers paid when they were supposed to. This number is called the potential gross income. Potential gross income is the monthly rent times the number of units. To find the potential gross income for this property, we take the 20 units and multiply that by $500 to get our potential gross income every month. So our monthly potential gross income is $500 times 20 units is $10,000 every month. $10,000 every month times 12 months comes out to $120,000 a year. You knew when you first bought this property that if you could get those bad tenants out or get them to start paying, you could add money straight to the NOI. The property has the potential to make $120,000 a year, but because it's being mismanaged, it's only making $100,000 a year. You realize this and notice the current owner is missing out on $20,000 a year. You also realize that the building looks run down, so if you cleaned up the trash outside, did some nice landscaping, and painted the buildings, you could make the apartments feel nicer, therefore be able to charge more rent and attract a higher quality of tenant to your building. You look at your competition and find out that new rents after the buildings are fixed up is going to be $750 a unit every month. So now we go back and figure out our new potential gross income. $750 a month times 20 units is $15,000 a month. $15,000 a month times 12 months is $180,000 a year. Your new potential gross income after fixing the place up is going to be $180,000 a year. To do this, you told yourself that you're going to need to spend some money to fix the place up. You learned that you need $30,000 for paint. $15,000 for landscaping, and $5,000 to pay someone to haul off all the trash laying around. In addition to buying the property for $800,000, you're going to spend the extra $50,000 fixing the place up. You know that it's an investment in the property because if we spend the money, it's going to boost our NOI. We tell the bank all of this and ask them to pay for 80% of our improvements too. So now our pro forma looks like this. If you're listening to audio, go look at page 185 of the physical book to see the new pro forma. Notice how property value went up, debt and equity went up, debt payments went up and the cash flow went down. The cash flow went down because our debt payments went up in year one, but we've not started to receive any additional income until year two. Because the bank is going to lend us an extra $40,000, our payments are going to go up. We're also going to have to come up with an extra $10,000 of cash to make the improvements, but this is money that's well spent. We know that our NOI is going to rise significantly in year two. To estimate what our NOI, equity value, and cash flow is going to be in year two, we need to do some math and put the numbers into our pro forma that we calculated. Let's plug that in from the math we did, finding out what our new income will be in year two. So on top of page 186, we're going to forecast with the new PGI, which is potential gross income, what the pro forma in year two is going to look like. 
our income rose, our expenses went up by the rate of inflation, our debt payment stayed the same, and as a result, our NOI and cash flow go through the roof. In year two, we boost our cash on cash return to 58%. What about our equity in the property? What happens to it? Well, as you know, we bought the property on an eight cap. Because it was so run down, some of the tenants weren't paying and the property looked rough, we got a good deal. We came in and fixed it up and also replaced lower quality, which is high risk tenants, with high quality and therefore low risk tenants. As a result, we make our property more attractive and a lower risk investment. As a reward for making this property nicer and lower risk, we now get to use a lower cap rate for the property. So while we bought it as a C-class building, we've turned it into a B-class building. As we look at what cap rate we should use, we find that other apartment units similar in size and quality to this investment are being sold on seven caps. So we value our property now on a 7% cap rate because that's what the market tells us we should do. Let's look at the property value on a seven cap using the year two NOI of $143,000. So look at that. Our new value in year two is over $2 million. If you're listening to the audio, go look at page 187. We have $143,000 NOI. And to get our new value, we divide that number by 0.07 or 7%. Now, if we had used an eight cap, the property would have only been worth $1.79 million. But because we made the property lower risk, we changed our cap rate and boosted the value. Look at page 187 to take a look at these charts. Now, at the end of year two, we have $1.37 million of equity in the property. And you're telling me, that's great and all, Hayden, but I already get this. This is value-add investing. So how do I twist this to get free real estate? Well, in the following illustration, we're going to compare the property from year one to year two. The bar on the left represents the property at first. It was worth $850,000 after the renovations, and it was 80% levered. The clear part of the bar represents equity. On the right, we have a much larger bar because the property value has gone up. The debt level, which is the shaded part of this illustration, has gone down slightly due to paying down the loan balance. Now we have a large amount of equity. On page 188, you can see these two visuals beside each other. Once you execute on the value add, you have several options, and all of them are good for you. Look at the image on page 188. The bar on the left represents the property when you first bought it. The equity amount is only 20%, so you don't have a lot of options. If you look at the bar on the right, it represents the property once you've added the value. You have a huge amount of equity. This is where you're going to make some amazing money and get free real estate. Now that the value has been added, the property is worth much more and your debt has been paid down. Your property now sits at 32% LTV. And as you know, we can go up to 80% LTV on these investment properties. The free real estate playbook goes like this. Buy a property, add value to the property, go back to the bank and do a cash out refi. I like to do a cash out refi and get just enough money back to pay off my first loan and pay my investors their original amount. It looks like this. Check out the image on page 189 if you're listening to this. So you go back to the bank at the end of year two and you tell your banker, hey banker, thanks so much for lending me on this apartment building. I have two pieces of really good news. The first piece of good news is that the property is doing great and it's now worth over $2 million. The second piece of good news is that I'd like to do a refinance for 850000 You see, when you do a refinance at the same level of the original total project cost, you'll have enough money coming back to you to pay off the first mortgage and also give my investors all their money back. Now that we do the refinance, we're going to see a jump in the cost of debt because our loan is now bigger. At the bottom of page 189, you'll see the image of what the pro forma looks like when we take out more debt. Your debt has gone up to $850,000, and because of that, your annual payments are going to rise from $44,000 to $55,000. You can see this change in debt between year two and year three. So if you have your own money to do this deal, if you had the $170,000 up front, that's awesome. The refinance is going to be $850,000. Out of that money, you're going to pay off your first loan. Then you can take the rest of that money and put it back into your bank account. Or you can buy a Ferrari. Or you could bury it in your backyard. Do whatever you want with it. It's your cash and it's tax-free. Congratulations, because you now have a free piece of real estate. You own the property all by yourself at 100%, and you have all the money you originally used back in your possession to use whatever you want. And by the way, again, all this money is back tax-free. It is not taxed. Now you own a real estate investment that you have no money in, and you're going to make $90,000 in cash flow every single year for the rest of your life. Also, what happens when that debt gets paid off? That's right, no more debt payments. When you wait the full time period and have your tenants pay off your debt, you get a raise. No more debt payments as your cash flow will be equal to your NOI. So, if your NOI was $146,000, after your debt's paid off, you would be able to pocket and keep the full $146,000 as cash flow for that year. If you didn't have the $170,000 up front and you partnered with investors, then now is the time to give your investors all of their money back. 
The strategy for bringing in investors looks like this. You say, hey, Mr. Investor, I know you have a lot of money sitting in your account, which is losing value daily from inflation, and you need to invest it in good projects. I have a great project I'm working on right now, but I need some equity to make it happen. If you fund the project, I'll get you all your money back in three to five years, and after that, you'll still own a piece of cash flow real estate for the rest of your life that I do all the work on. You're telling your potential investor that they're going to get all their money back in full, and they're still going to make cash flow from that for the rest of their life. Once you get your investor their money back, you can decide what makes sense for the arrangement. You could tell your investor they're going to get 10% on their original money and make $17,000 a year. For your investors, they're still getting a 10% cash on cash, but now they have all their money back. And this is an amazing income stream for any investor. You could tell your investors that you'll split the cash flow 50-50. From here, there's a lot of options, and this is where you can cut a deal that makes sense for both you and your investors. Many investors will wonder why they should invest with you instead of just doing it themselves. While some investors will have the time to do it themselves, the truth is many will not, and time should not be a limiting factor for someone to get into real estate as an investment. As someone who works with investors, you need to clearly understand the value that you bring to the table. In every business venture and partnership, each party will bring some sort of value to the table. Most people think value only means money, but that's not true. Your time to execute on a project is a great form of value you can bring to a partnership. Expertise, in many cases, is much more valuable than both time and money. Don't forget, you can also give your investors tax benefits to decrease their tax bill. Wealthy people flush a lot of money down the drain each year by paying taxes, and real estate can help them pay less in taxes. Give your investors a copy of this book so they can read it for themselves. If you show an investor how they can invest $100,000 in real estate and save $80,000 in taxes in the first year, I think they'll be willing to listen to your opportunity. Now go make it happen. Chapter 58, Full Refinance. Another option you have after you added all the value to a property would be to take a full refi instead of just refinancing to the level of investor payoff. We have the same image from before, but now we've added a third option. This option is going to visually show us what would happen if we did a full refi instead of a partial refi. If you're listening to this book and you want to go take a look in the physical copy for the graph, look on page 193. With the property valued at $2,046,000, you could do an 80% LTV refi on this property and receive $1.637 million. You will have to use some of this to pay off the original loan, though. So, out of the $1.637 million, you're going to have to give the bank $669,000 back. But even after you pay off your loan, you'll have $967,000 in tax-free cash. You could give your investor back double their original money at a $340,000 payoff and keep $627,000 for yourself and still own the property. After you deposited that $627,000 into the bank account, you would still look to receive cash flow from the property each year. Let's take a look at what that looks like. So now we're going to go back to our pro forma and figure out how much cash flow would we receive if we bumped up our debt payment all the way to the 80% maximum LTV. Your debt payments would more than double, but you'd still get almost $40,000 a year in cash flow, and you could expect that to go up over time. In addition to your cash flow, if you were to sell the property, you would have that 20% in equity that would come back to you. That 20%, even though it's hidden money, is still worth $450,000. To recap, you or you and your investor invested $170,000 and then could A, get paid off in full in two years and still cash flow $94,000 a year from the property, or B, take a full refi and take the $967,000 to split between the two of you and still cash flow almost $40,000 a year. You could sell the property and walk away with another $450,000. Over time, you're going to have your tenants pay off your debts over the next coming decades. Benefit from appreciation and rent growth, pay little to no taxes from the depreciation, and take the $450,000 of equity and do this whole formula over again tax-free with a 1031 exchange when you sell on the back end. Listen, is there anything you can think of that sounds better than this? These numbers I'm giving you are just an example. You have many options on how to give your money back to your investors and earn them a great return once you successfully add value to a property. All of this is made possible by understanding the fundamentals of real estate. If you didn't know how cap rates work or how to finance a property, none of this would be possible. Once you understand all this, the only thing left for you to do is execute. Section 12, how you can start today. Right now, you're probably thinking to yourself that this is great. You're so happy that you read this book and you're ready to get started capitalizing on these benefits of real estate. Right now, you're in one of three situations. You have money but no time. You have time but no money. You have money and you have time. So let's talk about how you can get started in each of these situations. Chapter 59, you have money but no time. This is a lot of people I talk to. 
This could be you if you're a lawyer, doctor, or an engineer. Anyone who enjoys their primary job where they do well financially, but they're getting eaten alive in taxes and also work a normal work week, and they don't want to give all the way their free time to dealing with real estate. These people want to start building cash flow and pay less in taxes. These are primarily people who invest in deals with people like me. In the world of real estate, there are people like me who take investors' money to buy real estate and benefit both parties. I'm called the sponsor or the syndicator. The investors bring money to the deal, and the sponsors go out and find the deals, underwrite the deals, find the banks to give a loan, buys the property, performs the value add, manages the property, and does the refi. The sponsor will also be in charge of overseeing the property staff, tenant relations, and much more. There is a significant amount of work and knowledge that is needed to be a good syndicator. This works out well because the investor has a lot of money, but they don't have a lot of time. The investors may have expertise as well, or they may not. The investors are relying on the sponsor to be reputable and to know what they're doing to execute the project. So if you're a doctor, lawyer, engineer, business executive, entrepreneur, or in any other field that you really enjoy working in and you make good money, but you don't have time to go out and find and buy and operate these investments, you may want to team up with a sponsor like myself. While you may have never heard of this before, people like me are out there all over the country buying real estate deals and making them and their investors very wealthy. One thing to be aware of if you're going to invest with a sponsor Make sure the person has a track record of success. If they've gone to one seminar and watched a couple of YouTube videos but never owned a property, you may want to catch up with them on a later deal. The truth is, there's a lot to be learned in the world of owning and operating real estate, and you don't want to be the sponsor's guinea pig. Questions you should always ask before investing with a sponsor are these. Tell me about your last deal. What is your strategy? What markets do you invest in and why? What legal structure will you be using? Do I have to be accredited to invest with you? Tell me about a deal that went bad. How did you handle the failure? What is the exit strategy of this investment? Here's how they should answer. Tell me about your last deal. The sponsor should tell you about whatever it is they're working on or some deals that they've been doing. If they can't answer, then they're new and you're likely to be their guinea pig. When you ask them, what is your strategy? If they can't quickly answer or tell you how they plan to make money, buckle up because you're going to be in a scary ride. The sponsor or syndicator should very easily tell you how they plan to make money. An investor should always know the market, which is the city in which the property is located, demographics of the deal. Why are they investing in that specific market out of the thousands of cities in America? If they've not paid attention to the market and are only looking at the deal, proceed with caution. The market is the most important factor to be able to execute on a business plan. When you ask them, what is your legal structure? If they're not certain, you should be cautious. There's a difference between them not being certain and relying on their legal counsel and them not being certain and having no clear path to certainty. Lawyers are good for both parties. Always be sure to have an operating agreement signed up front that clearly lays out who holds what responsibilities and how everyone will get paid. The legal structure you choose to use will determine how much taxes you pay and what your legal liability is. Always have your legal documents done up front. They're an investment and worth every penny. Do I have to be accredited to invest with you? To be accredited means to have a net worth over $1 million, excluding your personal residence. You're also accredited if you make over $200,000 a year if you're single or $300,000 a year if you're married. There are many SEC regulations that prohibit a sponsor from taking an investor's money unless they're accredited. There are some loopholes here, so ask your sponsor how they plan to handle this. If you're not accredited, you can still invest with a syndicator. You'll have to find a syndicator who accepts non-accredited investors. Don't let not being accredited stop you from finding a good syndicator to work with. There are many different legal structures. You just have to make sure you're following the law appropriately and making sure that you guys are getting everything done buttoned up according to the SEC laws. If the questions, tell me about a deal that went bad and how did you handle your failure? Listen, life is easy and everyone's high-fiving when things go well, but how does a person handling your money behave when things don't go as planned? Did they give up and leave you in the dust? This is more of a character question of the person you're investing with that you're going to want to be sure to ask. Listen to the response closely and imagine what your life would look like with this person if things don't go as planned. If the question is, what is your exit strategy? If the sponsor doesn't have a clear exit strategy, then I would avoid investing with them. Before you enter an investment, you should always ask yourself, how and when is the investment going to end? An exit strategy could be a refi or it could be a sale. Saying that you don't have an exit strategy is not an exit strategy. If you get a fishy feeling from the answers of any of these questions, please proceed with caution. As an investor, you should be getting yourself into a passive investment that requires little or no time on an ongoing basis while you're still getting the benefits of appreciation, leverage, cash flow, and equity build up with tax benefits. If you've ever heard the term mailbox money, that's what I'm talking about here. When you partner up and invest with a high quality sponsor, 
Your only obligation will be going to the mailbox every month to pick up your check. If you're interested in starting a conversation about being a passive investor with me, go to haydencrabtree.com forward slash investor. We'll schedule a call and we can talk about the deals I'm currently working on, or I can connect you with a reputable sponsor that I know that's doing high quality deals in your area. Chapter 60, you have time but no money. This is where I started out back in college. I had ample time, but I was a poor college kid who didn't have a big bank account. My personal journey led me to finding a mentor and working for him for free for over a year to learn the ropes of real estate investing. Luckily for you, I've just shared a ton of knowledge with you and have shortcutted your journey. I really wish I had this book when I was first getting started. You could take the same path that I did and find an investor near you and ask to shadow them. If you can shadow them and see a couple of deals, you can begin to use their experience to build up your track record. Once you have a few deals under your belt, you're going to begin to gain confidence and can have educated conversations with potential investors. It's extremely important that you realize the most active and successful investors will not let you shadow them. This worked successfully for me because I was willing to give, give, give. I would give my time and do the best I possibly could, asking for nothing in return. I was willing to learn and add value to his business without asking for anything. If I was stingy with my time or lazy and was taking up their valuable free time, the mentor relationship wouldn't have worked as well as it did. If you're going to find a mentor, be sure you can find ways to add value to their life and their business first. When someone successful gives you their time, respect that and treat it like gold. The most successful investors don't want to waste their own time on someone who's going to flake out. If you do get a meeting, always respect their time. Be sure to show up early, dress professionally, and do your research on them beforehand so you can ask educated questions. If they deny you a meeting, find a way to add value to them. Find interesting articles that could benefit them and send it to them. Find some deals that you feel like are good and bring it to them as an investor. Be creative and do whatever it takes to make it happen. Another option for you would be to live extremely lean and save as much cash as possible. It'll be tough, but if you want it bad enough, you can find a way to save up enough money to buy your first investment. There are strategies out there such as getting 0% interest credit cards and pulling out all the cash to buy property or house hacking your way to your first property. You can even lease and then sublease properties out to begin building cash flow and a nest egg to go put into your first deal. With education, you can find deals like I did that make $108,000 a year with no money down. That case study can be found in the back of this book. You may be tempted to jump right in and try to go out and raise money. I applaud you for this, and I always want you to keep your eye on that prize. The truth is, is that you should deal with your own money before you deal with an investor's. You will learn so much from your first deal about how to buy, manage, and profit from real estate. I've been told and agree with the idea that even if you don't make any money from your first deal, you should still do it. The amount of information you'll learn will stick with you for life, and you'll have an invaluable education. But of course, you should always aim to make money. Chapter 61, you have money and time. This could be you if you run an internet business that makes a lot of money, but it doesn't require a lot of time. Or maybe you're retired and looking for something to do so you can make money and keep yourself busy. Whatever the case may be, if you have money and time, then I would suggest you get started investing in real estate yourself with your own money. From the lessons you've learned in this book, you'll have an amazing head start and a very good path to get started. The amount of cash you have will determine the size of your first investment. As Warren Buffett says, don't test the depths of the river with both feet. I would also suggest that you don't spend all your money on your first project. Your first project will teach you many lessons and some of them may be expensive. Don't let that prohibit you from getting started. All successful investors had a first project that taught them many lessons. You should continue educating yourself with books, seminars, and training. I don't understand why so many people dive headfirst into a college education that's going to cost them more than $100,000, but they're not willing to spend any time or money on courses or seminars that cost a tenth of the price and actually teach you how to make money and become a better, more effective human. I love courses, seminars, and coaching. I'm constantly learning from others to optimize my life, and you should be too. If you're ready to take action and execute on what you learn, I'd encourage you to apply to my coaching program. This program has been designed from the ground up to take you from wherever you are now in the real estate journey and guide you through your first successful real estate deal. It's not for everyone and requires an application to be accepted, but for the right person, I truly believe it will change your life forever. I encourage you to learn more about this at HaydenCrabtree.com forward slash academy. Again, HaydenCrabtree.com forward slash academy. Lastly, you can find links on every resource mentioned in this book, along with video training deep dives into each of the topics mentioned here at no extra cost to you at HaydenCrabtree.com forward slash resources. Chapter 62, Conclusion. Thank you so much for choosing this book and investing in yourself. I wrote this book for the person that I talk to every week who wants to live a better life and have more wealth, but doesn't understand in their core how they can make that happen. I hope this book has opened your eyes to the unique powers of real estate that create so much wealth for those that choose to get involved. 
It is with great confidence I tell you that once you correctly invest in real estate, you'll be hooked on its benefits forever. If there's any way I can help you out, please reach out to me and I will help you. You can get a hold of me on Instagram at Hayden Crabtree by sending me a direct message or I ask that you come join my free Facebook group, The Art of No Money Down Real Estate Investing at HaydenCrabtree.com forward slash community. Snap a picture with the book and tag me in an Instagram post and I'll send you a special goodie to help you get started on your real estate journey. This is your journey to financial freedom and living the life of your dreams. If you found this book valuable, please text or email this link to someone you care about, HaydenCrabtree.com forward slash free book. I want to help build that person's financial education. I'll send them a copy of this book for free and they can enjoy the lessons too. From there, you two can hold each other accountable and possibly even partner on deals. Please do me a favor and send a link right now if you found any piece of information here useful. As we wrap up, I want to reiterate how important it is for you to not only absorb this knowledge, but most importantly, use it. Knowledge without action is useless. You now have the knowledge that very few people in the world do. So go use it. Get out of your comfort zone and take action today. About the author. Hey guys, my name's Hayden Crabtree and I'm so glad you've read my book. This book and all the information in it is what I've dedicated my life to since I was 19. I had a passion for business and entrepreneurship, but wasn't learning much in college that it could actually help me make money. At that time, I dove in head first to learn all I could about money, wealth, and business. A common thread I kept coming across was that many wealthy people had their hands in real estate. At this point, I knew nothing about real estate, but was very anxious to learn. I sought out a mentor who was a full-time real estate investor and worked for him for free for over a year. During this process, I learned more than you could ever imagine from college or any book. I got my hands dirty in every aspect of real estate. After several years of work in real estate full-time, I realized that not only was I passionate about building wealth in real estate for myself, but I'm also passionate about helping others take advantage of the huge benefits of real estate that almost no one knows about. Today, I'm an active real estate investor that lives in Atlanta, Georgia, and I invest all over the Southeast. Currently, I invest in self-storage facilities. I help other people who want to invest with me in those deals earn passive cash flow, enjoy great tax benefits, and make a lot of equity. I want to say thank you. Thank you so much for reading my book. I would really appreciate your feedback in any way you have feedback. I need your input to make the next version of this book and my future books better. Please leave me an honest review on Amazon letting me know what you think about this book. Thanks so much.